a couple of weeks ago, I had a glitch happen to me at work. A little background first. I, 44, female, am used to stuff disappearing only to show up later where I had originally left it. This is important to the story because I always feel like I'm losing stuff only to find it later. Sometimes hours, sometimes days. But it will usually show up where I was sure it was supposed to be. My husband often finds stuff for me too, and always where I was sure that I had left the item. Also, I don't drink and I don't partake in mind-altering recreational substances either. Never have. Let me explain a bit about my job, too, just so you understand the glitch better. I work in an office for a mortgage company. Now, this isn't a place where people come in to acquire a mortgage for a house. This is a place where legal documents are created for mortgages in different states of the mortgage life. For instance, I work in the Lean Release Department. The documents that I work with are the ones that release a person from the bank once their mortgage is paid in full. Mostly what happens with my specific job is that I receive documents from the client, or rather the bank that holds the mortgage, which have been signed by said client. I check in these loans by running reports to make sure they're good to go, and I send them to the account they're supposed to go to, to be recorded. Each client is also referred to as a project, and each project has a lead over that project. I work on roughly 25 different projects, but I'm not the lead over any of them. If there is an issue, however, I email the lead letting them know the issue and put the documents aside until the lead can get back to me about the document that is having the issue. Now that I have the background for the story out of the way, let's move on to the actual glitch. A day or two before the glitch happened, I received a loan that had an issue. I messaged the team lead about the issue and put the documents aside in a stacker tower so it would be safe for when the lead got back to me. I should also mention that each one of my projects have a different color cover sheet so I can more easily locate them when I need them again and some projects do share the same color of cover sheet, but the project name and specific information is handwritten on every paper by me, so I can easily identify when I need it again. A day or two later, the team lead finally emailed me back about the issue and what to do to fix the problem. I pulled out all the loans that had issues to look for this specific loan. I knew that the cover sheet was purple, so I looked for purple cover sheets. The loan wasn't there. Not only that, there were no purple cover sheets at all in this relatively small stack of papers. There weren't many loans there as it was, only three others. I thought that maybe I accidentally put it somewhere else. I searched every possible place that I could have absentmindedly put it, but it was nowhere. I checked through the same papers again, in the slot of the stacker that I reserved for loan issues, on which I'm waiting for the answer. Still not there. I emailed the team lead and apologize about losing the papers. He informed me that he would let the client know that the papers went missing, and will ask if they can sign another one to send it out. I felt terrible. I searched several times throughout the day just to make sure that I wasn't just missing them somewhere. After all, I am notorious when it comes to losing things. After work, I went home, not worrying about it. I'm actually one of those people who leaves work at work and doesn't think about it when I'm off the clock. I'm a mom when I get home, and with a rebunctious six-year-old boy with special needs that requires a lot of attention, my mind has other things that occupy it. I know a lot of people still worry about work when they leave for the day, but not me. Anyways, I digress. The next day when I arrived at work, I look again for the documents before I move on and completely stop worrying about the missing loan. After all, the team lead already said he would contact the client about it and have a new one mailed out. So, I just moved on with my workday. Halfway through my shift, 
a different team lead emails me about a loan of hers which had an issue. I grab the papers to find the loan for this project, which has a pink cover sheet. But as I sifted through the papers, I see a purple cover sheet. I pull out the document, only to see that it was the missing loan. I couldn't believe my eyes. My heart was pounding. I knew it wasn't there before, the many times that I had looked. There were only three documents there that had issues, and none of them had purple cover sheets. I sent a message to the team lead via Teams Messages to let him know that I found it. He was very happy about it, and he informed me to just process it out to the county, and that he would let the client know that it had been found. I really don't know what happened. I looked so many times, and it was not there. This kind of stuff happens to me all the time. It's stuff like this that makes me want to believe that maybe our lives are nothing more than a simulation. Okay, so this story is nothing big compared to some of the stories I've read, but it still blew my mind. This happened about a month ago. I was driving in my small city that I live in, and I was coming close to a roundabout. This roundabout had four sections leading in and out. I was coming straight ahead, and right opposite of me, there was a gray car coming in. This is where the glitch happens. I was starting to slow down to potentially stop if the car was about to pass me so we wouldn't collide. But as the car got into the roundabout, it drove behind tall grass in the middle of the roundabout, and it just never came out on the other side. I was baffled. I almost stopped to let it get through, but it just disappeared. There's nowhere it could have gone. The road on the left was very long and straight, so it couldn't have gone there. I just really didn't know what to think or do, and it still blows my mind. I was packing my things to head to my college city for my residency, and due to the overwhelming hot weather that came out of nowhere, I had to unpack my summer clothes to take with me. I chose my best shirts, and as I was refolding them, I would try to think about outfit options, trying to measure for how many days these outfits will last me, when my mind drifted off topic as it usually does. That's when my mind went back to the current topics. The war overseas, climate change, my country's economy, and about my future. I wondered what has become of us as humanity when I started mechanically folding my shirts and I picked up my blue shirt. My blue shirt has letter prints on it that I usually wasn't able to make out, or try too hard to read because I bought it from a Chinese thrift store, and I knew it wouldn't make any sense, since many times the shirts have grammatical errors or the sentences are gibberish. I pick up my shirt to take a better look at it, and see if the sleeve length is good for the weather, when I saw the shirt's letter print and weirdly could make it out. It wrote, What we think we became and I froze. I found it very odd, like it was a sign or something. I just found it very odd and I wanted to share. So to start off, I live in Northern California, like 250 miles north of San Francisco. Anyway, my granddaughter needed to go to the dentist, and the closest pediatric dentist is 190 miles south of where I live. We decided to make a trip of it. My daughter, granddaughter, my best friend, and my boyfriend all went to spend the night in a motel, and we took her bright and early the next day. So we're on our way back going north on the 101 highway, and we all know there's a rest stop coming up. It's past Willits, but before Laytonville, 
and you can see it from the highway once you take the turn to go to the rest stop. You go over a small bridge and drive a bit back south to get to the rest stop. So, we see the rest stop, and we see a blonde lady standing by a white car in the parking lot, so we take the exit, go over the bridge, drive south on this access road, and no one or nothing is there. No rest stop, no lady, no car. We were all confused. So we're like, okay, this is weird. So we get back on the highway going north again, and still just confused, and we don't know what to think. So we're driving along, and there is the lady again, and the rest stop, and the white car. How did this happen? There's no way this lady could have gotten ahead of us, and we all clearly saw everything exactly the same a few miles back. And it all vanished, and then all of a sudden, she's ahead of us. Same exact everything. We just don't know what to make of this. I want to go ahead and preface this story by saying I can understand why anyone would think I'm crazy for thinking that what has been happening for the last couple years is a glitch in the Matrix. Unfortunately, as you'll find out, I'm just not sure what else I can chalk this experience up to, and maybe telling myself this is a major glitch in the Matrix is making me feel a little better. Also, I apologize in advance for how lengthy I expect this story to be. I'm a new listener to the ATRD podcast, and have been listening on an almost daily basis for a couple of months now. The Glitch in the Matrix episodes have always been some of my favorites, and I recall a previous story posted by someone who believed their entire existence was a glitch. After hearing of their encounters, I just couldn't push the thought out of my mind and have wondered if my family isn't experiencing the same thing. Since moving back to my hometown in 2015, my grandma has always been my best friend. She's a successful businesswoman in our community, the owner of a large company worth well over a million dollars in assets, and on top of that, has always managed to keep her family at the center of her life. For the last few years, my grandma has lived a very busy, but pretty casual, lifestyle. She grew up in a small town, and her family just barely passed as low income. In fact, she didn't have much of anything growing up, and her family was always considered what others would refer to as hillbillies. Because of that, she worked herself nearly to death for about 10 years, but once her business ventures turned high profits, she was able to live life at a slower pace. She had the ability to get up when she wanted, go to bed when she wanted, take vacations on a whim, skip work altogether to spend time with her family. She had people she trusted to run things whether she was there or not, and she enjoyed using her time to start new projects, rub elbows with other business owners, or just to relax and goof off. I got kicked out of my parents' house just before my senior year in high school. My grandma was quick to give me a place to live, took me out to buy anything I could want and need, and pretty much gave me anything I ever asked for. I was never really the type of kid that asked for much, so when she would offer to take me shopping for whatever I wanted, or bring me lavish gifts like a brand new iPhone or a brand new model MacBook, I always felt like she was using it as a way to buy my admirations. Just a note here for anyone that might be confused, I was taken away from my dad's side of the family when I was seven, and at this point in time, I'm 17. I hadn't seen this grandma in over 10 years, so honestly she was a complete stranger and it felt very weird to me to go from an abusive household to a place where I was getting high-priced gifts thrown at me just for being around. 
I tried to go out of my way to spend as much time with her and my grandpa as possible, and not just to get to know them, but to show them that I was grateful for everything they did for me. My grandpa has always been a quiet, non-affectionate guy, so while we didn't get very close until things started glitching, my grandma quickly became my best friend. Everything from 2015 to 2020 was pretty much perfect. Not just for me, but for the whole family. There are five grandkids, including myself, and Grandma has just about always given us everything. When the three oldest grandkids turned 16, Grandma and Grandpa bought our first car. We got put on their insurance, their phone bills, not to mention we never had to worry about looking for a job. Grandma had a policy that all of her grandkids would have a place of employment, because it was her dream to pass everything down to us one day. The youngest two always had the newest gaming systems, rooms at Grandma and Grandpa's house with bunk beds and personalized murals on the wall so they could have sleepovers with friends whenever they wanted. The list went on and on. Yeah, so life was pretty good, and we were spoiled rotten. Grandma always told us that she wanted her grandkids to have everything in life that she didn't get the chance to have. And as long as we grew up with good hearts and respect for others, she was happy to do it. Fast forward to June of 2020, and things got weird. By weird, I mean that life as we knew it did a total 180, and to this day it hasn't been the same. My grandma had this friend that started hanging around a lot. We'll just call her M. She seemed nice enough. She was always ready and willing to help my grandparents or anyone else around with anything they needed. It wasn't uncommon to see her in one business or another doing little tasks for people without being asked, just because she knew they needed to be done. She matched my grandma's sense of humor and boisterous attitude. Plus, my grandma didn't have a whole lot of friends that she got to see on a day-to-day -day basis. So... It was nice to see her have a life outside of family and business. It didn't matter to me at the time, and should the situation have turned out differently, it never would have, but M was a lesbian. I was pretty much the last person to read into it since I myself was the rainbow sheep of the family. And I hate the stereotype that some people have that any gay woman with a straight friend must have romantic intentions. Anyways, a time progressed, and M and my grandma got to the point that they were pretty much inseparable. M was attending our family events, like wrestling or football games, and she was showing up to the birthday parties for one of the grandkids, and would almost always be poolside with my grandma and grandpa during the summer, when all the grandkids would be doing the swimming on an almost daily basis. To say that it got a little annoying would be an understatement. I felt like there wasn't a day I could get my grandma's attention without M standing over her shoulder. Like I said, I hate stereotypes, but like every other family member, I started to wonder what exactly was going on and why it seemed like my grandma's friendship with this lady turned into a full-on obsession. Pushing that out of my mind, I decided to stop reading into it and start distancing myself instead. My grandpa was a smart man, and if he didn't have any reason to be alarmed, I told myself that I didn't either. My visits to grandma and grandpa's house slowly dwindled, and, as much as it hurt, I felt my relationship with her fade more and more as her and M's got stronger. I'm sure that you might guess where this is going. And unfortunately, you're right. Without going into it too much, I'll just say that one of the older grandchildren found some pretty damning evidence, and we left it up to our grandparents to figure it out behind closed doors as much as possible. Even though I didn't ask too many questions, it was a hard thing to shake. I mean, my grandma dedicated her whole entire life to her family, so to see her put it all on the line for something like that... It was weird, but hey, 
I guess love will make you do crazy things. So far, you're probably thinking, so is this what you categorize as a glitch? But that was really just the kickoff for what we were about to experience. The couple months that came after the truth got out, I saw my grandma changing. I don't mean she was changing her clothing, her outlook on life. I mean everything about her down to the core things that she believed started changing. She was always anti-drug. As my dad is a non-recovering addict and has been for over 20 years, but started smoking recreational marijuana. She became obsessed with things like tarot cards, rocks, and minerals, and the certain powers that they held. The paranormal, witchcraft, and none of these things are anything I have a problem with, but it's something very uncharacteristic for my grandma. All of a sudden, it progressed to her believing that she had the power to talk to animals, control the weather, to tell the future. Her once simple wardrobe changed from basic sweatpants to MC Hammer type hippie pants. She traded in her hoodies for t-shirts that depicted bands that she never listened to. She was born deaf in one ear and hates listening to music in any form, as it disrupts her ability to hear. And she started dreading her hair. Obviously, all of these things were pretty abnormal and raised some red flags for our family, but honestly, much like you, we pretty much chalked it up to a midlife crisis or mental breakdown. Plus, she wasn't really hurting anything. If this was who she was, we were ready to accept that and love her regardless. However, like I said before, my grandma put her blood, sweat, and tears into her legacy for years. Her business, her reputation as a successful and kind-hearted businesswoman, and along with all the changes to her physical appearances and her tastes, she decided to sign her business away to my non-recovering addict of a father. My grandmother is a smart lady. I mean, she would have to be. To go from having nothing to living life comfortably and without a worry in the world. Just the sheer thought of her making a rushed and careless decision like this was an absolute nightmare to me. In the matter of two weeks, my father had fired almost every employee, including myself, and drained the company bank account to less than it has had in the last 20 years. Anytime Grandpa, the employees, or other family members would question what she was doing and express their concern, we were just met with a bunch of nonsense, such as, the birds can tell you the answers, or it's all written and laid out in the stars. Needless to say, Grandpa, myself, and the rest of the family had to make some pretty drastic moves. Not just to save the legacy that she had spent almost her whole life building, but to get her the help that we knew she needed. After weeks of countless trips to the lawyers, the banks, endless piles of paperwork, we finally filed the necessary court papers and declared her mentally unstable, so we could be given the power to kick my dad out. At this point, he was using the situation to his benefit to try to line his pockets, and maybe to get her to a doctor that could give us some answers. My dad hearing through the grapevine that we were trying to make things happen, decided that he would try to beat us to the punchline and get her to a doctor that would tell him she was of sound mind. Obviously, it backfired, and the checkup he took her into turned into a two-week stay at a mental facility. In the meantime, we were able to get him out of town, try to get things back on track, and send over papers to the mental facility stating they were legally obligated to keep my grandpa informed about what was happening with her, and what kind of answers they had for what was going on. No signs of Alzheimer's or dementia on her brain scans. None of her hormones were coming back abnormal. She was testing negative for any other drugs other than marijuana. One by one, the list of possible causes was getting shorter and shorter. Obviously, Diving into mental health is a little bit harder since there aren't really any tests you can do for indefinite answers, but even the doctors were at a loss. 
you had a 63 year old woman with no past experience with mental health issues that was in a state of total psychosis, talking to inanimate objects, living in a completely different reality. Trust me, we dove into basically every possible thing we could think of. Maybe she did some sort of recreational drug that sent her down a spiral and she was permanently fried. Maybe this was just a mental breakdown caused by years of stress and self-sacrifice. Sure, those are all great theories, but what throws those theories out the window for us and for the doctors is that she got better. A lot better, actually. Almost completely back to normal, and had zero memory of the countless weeks that she spent in her psychosis state. She described it as feeling like she was in a dream. She had scraps of memories here and there, but overall could not recall a whole lot of anything. And then, just a few months in her recovery from her breakdown, she regressed tremendously. The days of hippie pants and dreaded hair were out the window, and she was painting the walls of her homes with words that made no sense, talking to people inside the TV and becoming extremely violent. For the first time since I was born, she struck me across the face in a fit of rage, and this was the first time she had laid a hand on one of her grandchildren. She had little to no interest in any of the family members, constantly rebuking them or chastising them for things that just didn't happen and never had. This has happened three times now. She spent countless weeks in different facilities where they do test after test to find an answer and each time we come up empty-handed. This last time, the scariest of them all, she picked up a weird habit that I want to describe almost like a song or show glitching due to the lag of internet or something, where she would jerk her head and stutter over a word as if she was a malfunctioning computer. She's on the road to recovery again and doing great, but still, we haven't gotten so much as even a possible diagnosis of what is happening or why. I'm sure that this recount still doesn't make a whole lot of sense, as there are so many more things and details I could get into, but have already taken up so much time to write this out. And I would hate to keep going if it's not glitch material, but if a glitch in the Matrix is categorized as an event or events that can't possibly be explained, then that's the best way to categorize this. At least for me. I just hope that at some point we can get some real answers, and I can stop questioning the reality that I've known for years now. This is very out of my comfort zone to be sharing anything about my life with people. I'm a very private person, but I've been so creeped out by something that happened to me last week that I started researching Glitch in the Matrix stories to see if anyone had experienced anything like this. I work in an OBGYN clinic as a medical assistant. Friday evening was like every other evening. It was nearing 5 o'clock when the front desk clerk, Brooke, walked by me with her parents' new Louis Vuitton purse across her shoulder. The purse caught my eye because it's not her usual red bag that I see her carrying every day. She waved and said, See you Monday. Have a good weekend. I said, You have a good weekend too. I like your new purse, by the way. I've always wanted a Louis Vuitton. She smiled, went out the front door, as I heard the doorbells jingle. I walked to the back exam room to finish disinfecting everything before I left. I got done with that, and on my way out the door to leave, I noticed Brooke sitting at her computer. I giggled and said, You must have forgotten to finish up something. She looked back and said, No, I'm just finishing up now. Have a nice weekend. See you Monday. I thought it was a little odd, but just let it go, thinking she had forgotten something. I got out to my car and couldn't find my keys, and I realized I left them in the office. As I was grabbing them off the desk, Brooke stood up to leave again, and started wrapping her old red bag across her shoulder. 
I laughed and said jokingly, Are you carrying around two purses now? She looked at me strange and said, What do you mean? I said, Well, now that you have the new Louis Vuitton bag, I didn't expect you to be carrying the old one still. She looked at me strange again and then said, I don't have a Louis Vuitton. I paused for a few seconds and said, Oh, I'm sorry, I must have been mistaken. Have a good evening. We left and went our separate ways. I just don't understand what happened. I have such a sick feeling in my stomach now while I'm at work, and I'm terrified of something like this happening again. Okay. I've been reading this subreddit for years, and for some reason it just occurred to me that a glitch totally happened to me when I was around 18 years old, and it totally freaked me out at the time. I'm 23 now. I'd been hanging out at my friend's house and left to go home pretty late at night, 12am, 1am. I lived in a smallish suburb at the time, so at this time of night there was really nobody out driving. I got to the main road right outside my actual neighborhood, and was a few turns away from the street that I needed to turn on. I'd lived there for years at this point, so I was very familiar with this road and everything around. Next thing I knew, a huge deer jumped out from what seemed like nowhere. Like, it went from nothing at all in the road to the deer pretty much being right in front of my car. I remember thinking, holy crap, there's nothing I can do, I'm about to crash. I also remember thinking that the deer was almost literally running into my car, like not trying to run across the road, but like right into me. Then, I just remember this scream that came from like the depths of my being that I imagine only comes out of you when you know you're about to die or be seriously hurt. I went to slam the brakes, but, like I said, the deer was already at my car, and I braced myself, and then all of a sudden the deer was just not there. I looked in all directions, and there was no deer anywhere. I was driving on a four-lane road, and there were only buildings and parking lots on the other side of the road, so I would have definitely seen the deer if it somehow managed to jump out of the way. I couldn't understand what just happened, or why I couldn't see the deer anywhere, and I was actually thinking, is the deer stuck under my car, or like on top of it? I know that doesn't make sense, but I just couldn't process there being no deer. I picked up my phone and called my friend Alex, whose house I was just at, freaking out and telling him the story as I was pulling into my driveway and telling him that I was scared to get out of the car, because I was still half afraid the deer, or part of the deer, was on my car. But when I finally got out, my car was totally fine, and there was no sign of any accident there. I didn't know a lot about timeline jumps and glitches back then, but now I feel like maybe that's exactly what happened. When I was 22, three years ago, I was unable to sleep the night before a college final. It was a Sunday night, 10pm, and I set my alarm for 7am to go take my final at 8am the next day. It is worth noting that I regularly sleep through alarms, so I have an extra loud one at the foot of my bed, and that automatically stops after about 15 minutes of not being snoozed or turned off, which I then have a series of alarms I set on my phone just in case that doesn't wake me up. I'm a very heavy sleeper. I went to bed at 10pm, but a little after midnight, spending the whole time sweaty and unable to get comfortable and not being tired enough to fall asleep, I sat up in my bed and looked at my alarm clock. 1216. I start to think about how much sleep I'm going to get at this point if I can fall asleep soon. I blink, and it's 327. 
Did my alarm clock glitch or something and wasn't telling the correct time? Did I fall asleep momentarily? I check my phone and the charger next to me, and it also says 327. So, my alarm clock must be fine. It's at 100% charge now, so I take it off the charger and just set it back down. I look back at my alarm clock and think, what the hell? I blink again. 450. I'm in disbelief. My position hasn't changed. I've had an unbroken train of thought this entire time, and nothing has changed but the time. I blink again. 601. I blink again. 7 a.m. and my alarm is going off. My room is now bright, and I feel like the whole night passed. But I experienced only a minute of time passing, and never once lost actual consciousness that I'm aware of. I only blinked. Here's the wild, screwy part, though. I scooted to the end to turn off my alarm, grabbed my phone to look at it. It was completely dead. I plug it back in, waited a second, and then I turned it back on. It is now Wednesday morning. I've missed my final, and I can't account for the last three days. I have a bunch of texts from an angry girlfriend, emails from a concerned professor, the whole package. I cannot explain how this could have happened. It's difficult for me to fall asleep, it usually involves closing my eyes, waiting a long time of thinking and position changes, and then eventually I just wake up without remembering how I fell asleep. It was like I sat up in bed, slept away random intervals of time, without knowing that I'm falling asleep until eventually one of my alarms managed to wake me up days later. I wasn't hungry. My arms didn't hurt from sitting up in bed for literally days. I didn't need to use the restroom. It's by far the strangest thing that's ever happened to me. Has anyone else experienced something like this before? I work in the kitchen of a convenience store, and every day I bring a water bottle with me. Last week, I had brought my pink water bottle, and lots of my coworkers saw me with it. I had it sitting on the counter right next to the kitchen door, in a group with a few other water bottles from my coworkers. I had it when I started my shift at 1pm, and it was there up until 4.30 to 5. A little after 5, I left the kitchen to get some water and started talking to my coworker, who had been working right by the kitchen for a while. As we were talking, I went to grab my bottle, but it was nowhere to be seen. I asked my coworker, and she said that she had seen it when setting a bin down on the counter next to it. I looked everywhere that I could think of and texted my boss to see if she had grabbed it by mistake when she left. She hadn't taken it, and no one had any clue where it had went. So, I asked my manager if she could take a look on cameras for me, because... My only thought was that someone must have taken it. Even though the kitchen door was open and no one in the kitchen saw anyone come near the door, it was the only thing that made sense. My coworker who had been working right there said she hadn't seen anyone nearby either. My manager pulled up the footage from the camera that had a perfect view of the area in front of the kitchen. She started the video at 4.30 and we saw my pink water bottle. She sped through the footage to see if anyone came near the door, but no one did. Once the footage hit five, she stopped it, and noticed that the water bottle was gone. She replayed it and found the point where it disappeared. Rewatching the footage, I saw it sitting on the counter one second, and then it was gone the next. I continued looking around for a bit after that, but eventually I gave up. I haven't seen my water bottle since. All my life, I've had many glitches happen to me, but this one I found rather interesting and unnerving. 
almost 20 years ago, I had a memorable moment of deja vu. We had just moved in with some friends, and the next day I had to go to my college classes. I had to ride a new bus for the first time, and partway through the ride, everyone on the bus started freaking out because the bus wasn't going through the military base like it normally did. Instead, it went around it. It was all new to me, so I didn't think much of it. I got to school and into my first class, about halfway through, someone came in and told the teacher that the school was being closed and all the students had to go home. I'm dyslexic and I receive extra time on my tests, but I had to go to a special lab to get it. I was concerned because I had an appointment that day and if I missed it, I wouldn't get another chance. The deja vu started at this point. As I walked up to the door of the Proctor building, but I found it locked. I knocked and a woman opened the door, and I told her about my appointment, and she said, You haven't heard? I said no. She continued, Go home and watch the news. And she closed the door. I was confused and went to sit down. I remembered the entire interaction, word for word, from an extremely vivid dream that I'd had some time before. This happens to me periodically, so I didn't think much of it. My main concern was that I wasn't sure how to get back to my new home. When a woman came up to me and asked if I was alright, I said I was fine, but I was wondering what was going on. She said you haven't heard, and I said no. She seemed reluctant to tell me, but sat down and said that there would been an attack in New York on the World Trade Center. When I had my moment of deja vu, it was exactly when the second tower fell on 9-11-01. One of my favorite chickens, Fancy, went missing on January 12th. I saw her outside the day before, and she was fine, and then she just literally disappeared. The ring camera in the backyard wasn't charged that day, so I wasn't able to see if something happened to her. My husband charged the camera like normal after that because I was so upset that she had disappeared, and I wasn't able to see why because of the camera battery being dead. Anyways, I assumed that she escaped the privacy fence and got into the woods behind our house. I looked for her everywhere, and there was literally not a trace of this chicken anywhere. Saturday night, my husband and I were watching TV in the bedroom, and he went to let the dogs out in the backyard to go to the bathroom. I'm sitting in bed and the dogs come running back in the room with me because he let them back inside. A few minutes later, I hear this crazy loud banging that scared the crap out of me. I panicked, thinking someone attacked my husband or something while he was still out back. I run into the living room ready to kill someone, and my hubby is standing on the deck with a shovel, beating a possum. I freaked the hell out and got really upset even though I had told him a few months ago that if we ever caught another possum in the backyard to take care of it because they were killing my chickens. I regretted that so much after he actually did it, and it's eating me alive, but the possum was on the deck eating fancy, and that is why he killed said possum. But here's the thing, fancy hasn't been seen by any of us since January 11th, I checked the ring camera and the possum was eating her under the covered lawnmower that was sitting by our deck. I was really confused about this because we haven't seen her at all in two and a half weeks. Her body wasn't decayed at all, so she looked like the possum had killed her very recently. There was a fresh looking busted egg that had come out of her, so that tells me that it would have had to have killed her around the same day. If she had died and been there for a while, we would have smelled something. The egg from her also wouldn't look fresh because it would have begun to rot, and her body wasn't stiff at all. I looked at the ring camera to see when she came home because this was just blowing my freaking mind. 
and that she came back home and was immediately killed by a possum after being missing for so long. Like, how? There's no sign of her anywhere on the camera at all. I scrolled our ring footage from the past two and a half weeks, and there wasn't one video of that chicken anywhere, and our ring camera records most of the day and night. It's like she disappeared, and then reappeared already dead. There was no video of the possum actually killing her, and no video of her on the deck before it happened. So, she was there two and a half weeks ago, vanished without a trace, and then reappeared freshly dead. No sign of a struggle. The day I realized that she was missing, 111, I searched all over our yard, including the deck where she was found dead. Under the mower, under the mower cover, under the grill that's on our deck. I even searched the dang roof, because we have another chicken that likes to get up there and hang out. And I never found any sign of her. The whole situation is blowing my mind. It's like there was a fracture in time or reality where she was able to come home without being caught on our security camera at all, for who knows how long, and then was killed, and then just reappeared out of thin air already dead. Another thing that proves this theory is the fact that leading up to the possum being seen on the deck eating her, all my other chickens were completely calm and normal in the video footage. In the past, if a predator has gotten into the yard, they all freak out and make a ton of noise, and usually that is what alerts us to something being out there. The other chickens were fine. Quiet, calm. You would never guess that one of their flock members was being killed or eaten right in front of them. My dog never heard any commotion or even seemed to notice. It was the craziest thing ever. Also, as obsessed as I am with my chickens, I'm not cut out to own prey animals anymore because I can't handle the heartbreak of losing them to predators, and I also can't handle the heartbreak of killing said predator for doing what comes naturally to them. The end. I have reached a conclusion time and time again for years. The conclusion? Well, my family likes to eat salads, such as chef salads. A salad with lettuce, tomatoes, cucumbers, and croutons. My aunt came up with a dressing, and its dressing has olive oil, pomegranate balsamic, honey, mustard, salt, pepper, sweet paprika, garlic, and onion dust. But we also love potato salad, especially my dad, where the problem lies. For years, my mom made the potato salad's dressing with mayonnaise, ketchup, a bit of mustard, and a few drops of lemon juice and pomegranate balsamic. In the salad, beside the potatoes, we added gouda cheese, boiled eggs, and cold cuts. And that's it. That was how my mom always made it, and then one day back in 2016, my mom realized we had a few years to make a potato salad and decided to surprise us by making some along with the sausages a family friend had brought to the previous night's get-together that my parents had, with beers and various snacks. So, Mum surprised us with the potato salad. But it was not how she used to make it. I commented on how the taste was odd, and that she had added tomatoes, green and red peppers, and raw onions, and that she didn't add gouda cheese or cold cuts. Then, both my dad and sister looked at me confused, and said that the potato salad was the same as always. I was then baffled and asked my mom how she made the salad, but she just smiled and said that a cook never reveals their secrets. On the past Monday, May 23rd, 2022, I had to help my dad to cook lunch, aka potato salad, which we had a long time to eat again. And since my mom had hit her knee and she was in pain, and was busy sewing some old clothes, I helped dad with cutting the onion, the gouda cheese, and preparing the eggs while dad cut the tomatoes and peppers and potatoes. 
When we were done with all of that, Dad asked Mom to give us instructions on how to make the salad dressing. Mom went on to tell us, and I was baffled. The salad dressing, according to my mom, was mustard, pomegranate balsamic, salt and pepper, a spice mix, and olive oil. I was so confused because she didn't even add ketchup as she usually did, or at least that's what my taste buds tasted. Mum usually added more mustard and ketchup to the potato salad when we couldn't afford mayonnaise, but she never added onions and peppers or held the gouda cheese in cold cuts. Confused, I asked Mum why she changed the recipe, and both of my parents looked at me angrily too angry for just a recipe, and started to yell at me for making a big deal about the salad. I hadn't made a big deal. I just found it weird that I had to cut raw onions and peppers and tomatoes, and that Dad hadn't bought a mayonnaise for the salad, but I never voiced it. I just furrowed my eyebrows but kept following Dad's orders, thinking that my parents might have decided to shake things up and attempt something new. I grew hurt when my parents accused me of making a big deal about it, when in fact I hadn't, and I defended myself by saying that I hadn't said anything, and that I was okay with trying some new recipe. Then, Dad grew even more annoyed and yelled at me, asking what I was talking about with a new recipe. I went on to tell them about how we usually ate the potato salad, and they looked at me as if I had told them that I had signed myself up to join the European Space Agency while I failed physics and chemistry. Mom said we never ate potato salad with mayonnaise or ketchup, but I persisted that we did, and the only time we didn't was back in 2016 after that get-together. Dad sighed angrily and told me with an angry tone to stop being obsessed with mayonnaise, and if I didn't like the salad, I could cook something for myself. But we had never eaten a mayonnaise including potato salad. I gave up and ate the salad, which wasn't bad, but it wasn't something I would like to eat again. Or at least I wouldn't add the tomatoes to it and would add ketchup. I've many times butted head with my parents about the way they are making the salad dressings and salads that we usually eat. And every time they say that I'm wrong, and that we have never eaten the salad that way that I remember. Most times, I just give it up and chalk it up to me remembering wrong, but now I'm 10,000% sure that we have never eaten the potato salad like that again. Am I remembering a different timeline's potato salad or salad dressing? I have a small glitch in the Matrix story that I would like to submit. I've always been very skeptical when it comes to the inexplainable, but I believe that every once in a while, we all experience stuff that we have no explanation for. So instead of writing it off like nothing, I'm going to tell my glitch here. I was around 15 years old. I think it was a Saturday, and my mom had made burgers for dinner the day before. So I was really excited for lunch, as I knew I would be eating a burger put together from the leftovers. I'd taken out ketchup, onions, and tomatoes from the fridge, when I remembered that I also needed to put mayonnaise on it. So I opened the fridge once again and looked for the mayonnaise, but I couldn't see it. I figured we must have eaten the whole thing yesterday, but was still a bit confused, as I was sure that I had seen a glass of mayonnaise from just the day before. As it is only me and my mom in the house, there's never much stuff in the fridge, but I still used about 30 seconds to look for the mayonnaise in the fridge out of confusion, and just wasn't able to see it. And that's when I closed the fridge and went to the drawer under the microwave. My mom always keeps all kinds of snacks and foods down there that don't need cooling before they've been opened. I took out another jar of mayonnaise and was just about to open it, when I thought to myself that I should check one last time in the fridge. So, I went back to look again. 
I really made sure that it wasn't hiding behind something, even though there was nothing it could be hiding behind, but I couldn't see it. So I closed the fridge once again, went back to the new mayonnaise from the drawer, and opened it. I put some on my burger, closed the lid, and went to the fridge to put the new one in there so it could be kept cool. I opened the fridge again, and what I saw shocked me. Right in the middle of the fridge was a half-filled jar of mayonnaise. The one thing that I had been looking for the last two times that I opened the fridge. I didn't know what to think, and was mostly just annoyed that there were now two open jars of mayonnaise in the fridge. I know it's a silly story, but it still bothers me to this day, as I was so focused and in the moment of the whole situation that I don't understand how I could overlook the mayonnaise. Or, if it's a glitch, then why it might have happened. And please, do let me know what you think. Now, I was never the type of guy that believed in parallel universes or multiple dimensions, but... After a strange experience in years of research, I've begun to wonder about the possibilities of such things existing. And my change in mind occurred after a strange experience five years ago. I remember the date clear, 6th of September 2016. It was the day after I had moved into my new house, which I still live in today. It's a fairly old house, and I've experienced many odd things in said house, though those are different stories. The home was built in 1974 to 1976, and was completed in late September of that year. It had a few owners, one of which was my father's former boss. It's been kept in very good condition, and retains many of its original features. In the hallway, the carpet was a dingy yellow whenever I moved it. I had it replaced with a more modern carpet. When I had my experience, the carpet had yet to be replaced. Right. The story goes like this. It was our second day in the house, and our first night in the house. I woke up early, around 7, to help unpack boxes and our items. We were also moving items out of our house which belonged to the previous owner. I was loading a box labeled Silverware from our old green car, which was a 1995 Honda Odyssey. The box was heavy, and I lost some grip on the box. Luckily, I have quick reflexes, and I quickly reacted and nudged the box back into my hands, using my knees to prevent myself from dropping it. It was when I looked up again that things appeared differently. The first thing, which was hard for me not to notice, considering the box was in front of my eyes, was the word silverware. It had completely been replaced with the words records and books in black. I was confused at first and just simply dismissed it as my bad eyesight. It was not until I laid down the box on the lawn temporarily to close the car door that I realized something completely different from my eyes was messing up. The car. The distinctive green 1995 Odyssey was gone, and was replaced with a red Ford pickup truck. In complete and utter shock, I quickly hurried into the house to find my father. I don't know why, and I have no clue what I would have told him. I'm still unsure why I left the garden to find my father, Anyways, when I hurried into the hall, I spotted a figure walk into my parents' bedroom. He was tall and young, maybe 35 to 45, and was around 5'8". He wore a brown suit, almost like a, a tweed suit. He himself hurried along down the hall quickly, so I quickly followed this man in confusion. When I walked down the hall, I noticed that the carpet was cleaner and a stain that I had noticed earlier near my bedroom was gone. Perhaps if I hadn't been in such a frenzy, I would have noticed other changes. Anyways, I swiftly walked into my father's room. It was right at that moment, 
when everything went back to normal. The man disappeared, and boom, I nearly toppled my father, as I walked right into him when entering the room in which that man had entered. We were so close that I could feel his breath. Whoa, buddy, slow down, I remember him clearly stating. He was just as confused as I was. When I told him what I saw, we both walked outside, and there was the Green Odyssey, parked under our willow tree. The box was where I left it, and the car door was open. My father quickly dismissed the situation. I can't explain what happened in those brief moments, and probably will never fully understand what occurred on that warm September day. My father doesn't have an explanation for what happened that day, but he recounts that day as well. From his perspective, he remembers clearing some boxes, standing near the sliding doors of his bedroom, when he saw that same man walking away from the door. I find it odd that the man was walking in two completely opposite directions. He got curious and followed, in which I came storming in, falling into my dad's chest. I've told my family multiple times this story. No one really believes me. To them, it sort of becomes a dinner table story. But I truly believe that I was briefly transported into a different era. I can't confirm it, and perhaps if I had a phone back then... I was 15, and my parents were the type of parents who disapproved of young teens having phones, but maybe I could have taken a photo or two. Whether it was a time slip, a glitch in the Matrix, or just my mind playing tricks, this experience will remain in my memories for years. Hey guys, I'm going to preface this by saying this probably isn't the biggest glitch ever. It might even be one of the more mundane ones on this thread, but I still thought it was weird, interesting, scary, and totally worth sharing. I've recently moved into a new place. It's just me and my dog, and because I let the last place get pretty messy and unorganized... This time, I sort of made a pact to myself that I would try and stay on top of cleaning, general tidiness and housekeeping, as a small goal to achieve each day. As part of this pact to myself, I vowed to make my bed every day, even if not as soon as I wake up, but the goal was to never return to an unmade bed at night. This gives me the flexibility to do it at any time of the day, as long as when it's bedtime I return to a nice, properly made bed. Possibly a key fact to remember for the next part of the story. Anyways, today, I had an early 5.30am start, so I didn't make the bed right away, even though I try to do it first thing most mornings since I made that commitment to myself. I had a bit of a crap day at work, and ended up leaving it till like 4pm in the afternoon. I felt guilty that I hadn't done it yet, as previously the latest I've left it for is like midday or something. I've only lived here for like two months, so... I haven't slacked on the commitment too badly just yet. <laughs> Anyways, so I made the bed roughly, and I know I definitely did, because it was looking uneven. I'm not a perfectionist or anything, but at the moment, I'm basically camping out in my lounge room, because that's where the air conditioner is. So I literally had to go around the whole kitchen and laundry area to try and even out the other side of the sheets. It's a small unit, so it's a bit like a maze if your mattress is taking over the main lounge room space that leads to the other areas. Anyway, that was all done, and at this point, my dog was already sitting outside with her ball in her mouth waiting for our evening game of fetch. Right after I finished making the bed, and then going to the foot of the bed to admire my amazingly even work, I was like, okay, 
No time to play with my dog as she's waiting outside and whimpering because I'm taking longer than I usually do. So I admired my work making the sheets look equal for a moment, and then headed off after, directly into the backyard to go to play with her. Now, normally I leave the backyard door open so she has access to her water, which usually sits in the laundry. Lately, however, leaving that door open during the evening time has been attracting cockroaches, so I was very mindful of taking her water bowl outside and making sure the backyard door was firmly shut behind me, as I'm terrified of cockroaches. I played with her for a good hour or so, and then went inside to use the toilet. I get in, and lo and behold, my bed looks like something out of a hoarder's documentary. Not just was it unmade, but the quilt cover was so tangled up, the entire quilt to cover ratio was out of whack, and when I tried fixing it, which was the first thing my brain made me do, I couldn't even get the quilt to fully occupy the quilt cover, no matter what I did. It was like someone had jumped into my bed, rolled around in it, and tossed it around like crazy, making things as uncomfortable as they could for anyone else. Some points to take into consideration, it's just me and the dog in the house. The backyard door was firmly shut, and I was sitting right next to it outside. Front doors and only other point of entrance were double locked. Triple locked, actually, if you count the overhead lock, which I always make sure is fastened, as I try to be as careful as possible since I'm living alone. Basically, no one could have come or gone from either door, so my only guesses left are a ghost living within the house, or a serious glitch in the matrix, as I 110% know that I made the bed, and then came outside directly afterward. I've never felt any ghostly or haunted vibe coming from this place at all, though, so... I would definitely be questioning it if the general consensus was that it could be part of a haunting. That being said, I'm still pretty creeped out, if we're being honest, and would love to find a reasonable explanation for what happened. What are your thoughts? Any and all ideas would be much appreciated. Hello. I've never told this story to anyone, but I've kept it in my mind since it happened in 1998. I just want to preface by saying that I've never held a belief in ghosts, the afterlife, or anything of the sort, either past or present. Even this event is not enough to make me believe ghosts are real, however, I do not have any material explanation for the event. It was mid-August 1998. I was 22 years old and working a summer job at a gas station before heading back to school. I had started college late as I fumbled out for about a year or two after high school. Anyways, on a nice warm summer night, cars would come and go. As we had a full-service pump, I'd walk out of my little storefront for every car and pump their gas. The weather was perfect. Not too hot when normally it would be blisteringly hot at that time of the year. Around the side of the building were the entrances to the bathrooms. I headed that way to use the restroom when I saw two hippie looking teens with a dog. A boy and a girl. I grew up listening to bands like the Grateful Dead and Fish, and still do. And while I don't present as a hippie, I feel very comfortable in those circles. I could tell that these kids had probably been hitchhiking, and they didn't look destitute, but they were dirty and probably a bit hungry. Even though I was probably no more than five years older than them, I felt bad and I wanted to help. I put a few bucks in the vending machine, bought them some snacks and drinks, and I gave the dog a bowl of water. They were very thankful, and the doggo was very friendly. 
We chatted for a minute, and then the boy said, The dog's not ours. He was just hanging out here. He was friendly, so we just started playing with him and patting him. That was strange, of course, but not too crazy, right? Dogs get lost all the time. He was friendly and didn't look mistreated, so I just assumed that he had gotten lost. Oh, and he had a collar and tag, so cool, I could find his owner. And his name was Sam. Important to note that he would respond to me calling him by his name, which was Sam. A car pulled up to the full-service pump, so I ran out and did my thing. Last I looked, the hippies and Sam were still hanging out, at this time sort of off to the side of the store, near where I first saw them. I finished up with the car and turned around to head back to the storefront. No hippies anywhere in sight. Nowhere. Just gone. It, perhaps they had hitched a ride while I was turned around, but it was only for a minute. When I walked out to the street, I could see quite a ways in both directions. They were nowhere to be seen. This is the last I saw of the two hippie kids, and I hope they're okay. Sam was still there, but it was getting late. I wanted to help, so I decided to call the local police, who gave me the phone number of the animal shelter. I called over there, and the way that it was handled seemed very odd at the time, and still does. But I wanted to help, so I just went along with it. Sam was a good boy, after all. The person I spoke with at Animal Control looked up Sam's info based on the dog tag number, and the person, instead of saying, hold on, we'll send out an officer, or even just call the owner, instead gave me Sam's owner's phone number and told me to call them. Hmm? I called the number and an older gentleman politely answered the phone. I explained to him that I had Sam, that I gave him some water and that he was just hanging out with me here at the gas station, and it was closing soon, so it would be best for him to come pick him up. He seemed perplexed, and he asked me to describe Sam to him. I did. Sam looked like a mutt lab mix, darkish brown coat, a medium-large-sized dog, very friendly disposition. Just a regular old good boy. What the man said next has been rattling around my brain for the last 24 years. The man said, We had a dog named Sam, but he passed away a good 10 years ago. I was dumbfounded, and all I could do was describe Sam again, to which the man said, yeah, that sounds like Sam, but there's no way it could be. It just can't be. He was polite and we talked back and forth a bit more, but with no resolution, we hung up. I was unsure about what to do next, but I quickly realized that there was nothing for me to do. Just like the hippie kids, Sam too was now nowhere to be seen. He just vanished. My thoughts... I would give anything to have this make sense to be able to actually resolve this in a way that does make sense. I've never been able to. I have lots of thoughts and theories, but as the post is already very long, I'll end it here. But if anyone wants to ask questions in the comments, please do. And thank you for reading. Sometime in 2020, I think around March, before the UK lockdown, me and my cousin were playing Tekken 7 on my Xbox. Out of nowhere, the game crashes and goes back to the Xbox home, so I thought, oh, must have just been a little malfunction. I click the icon to start playing again, and a message that says enter a disc to play this game pops up. I knew from there that the disc must have gotten stuck, so I was gutted, but not too much as I only play the Xbox when my cousin is around, and also, I have the game on PC. The whole of 2020 goes by, and I didn't slash couldn't get my Xbox fixed due to COVID, 
and I wasn't too fussed on it, as, again, I didn't really play it. One of my sisters and I tried to get the disc out manually. There was a manual eject button you could press with something thin, so we used a paperclip. That didn't work, and we accidentally lost the paperclip inside the Xbox. Then, we even opened the Xbox up, trying to see if we could access the reader to get the disc out, but we needed specific screwdrivers for that, so no luck there. We eventually gave up, and my sister checked the game case just in case, but there was no game in it. Around April of 2021, I decided it was time to get the Xbox fixed, as my older sister was getting married in a couple of months' time, and so she was over frequently, and family would be over soon to help with preparations, etc., and so, it might be used to play. I took it to my local electronic experts, and I told them the problem. Disc stuck inside. And they said no problem, it'll be 20 pounds. However, if the reader happens to break while they're taking the disc out, it will cost more. The usual. I say fine, and I leave it to them. I then receive a text that same day from them saying that it's ready to be collected, and will only cost the 20 pounds. So I remember that I was happy that there was no damage done. I got to the shop, and they proceeded to tell me that there was no disc in the drive. I was utterly confused. My immediate thoughts were that they were scamming me, and that they took my disc. They're a trusted company, so I was a bit disoriented by this, or that they didn't really check. So I asked if they put another disc in it, and they said yes, and that it worked completely fine. They also found the paperclip that me and my sister lost, and then returned it to me in a small Ziploc bag. I then said thank you, and paid and left, still confused, and then I even phoned my sister, who couldn't answer as she was in a meeting, so I texted her everything, to which she then phoned me soon after. I tell her that they didn't find a disc, and that I think they maybe may have taken the disc, still believing this outrageous hypothesis that I made up. I go home, and just to make sure that I'm not going crazy, I check the Tekken 7 case. And what do you know? The game is there. I remember telling my sister this over the text, and she phoned again also confused, stating that she checked the game case on the night that we opened the Xbox up just to make sure I wasn't being silly but it really wasn't there. I still don't know what happened. I asked both my mom and dad, even though they never touched the Xbox, if they had maybe seen the disc and put it back in, and they both denied it. I then thought maybe a guest or an extended family member came over and saw it and put it back, but then I remember that it was during lockdown, so no one would have been at our house anyways. This really sucked, as it meant I could have used the Xbox for the past year, but didn't. But you couldn't blame me, as I was 100% sure that there was a disc stuck inside. I genuinely would have betted my life on the fact that there was a disc inside. I've got several far-fetched explanations, but they're all a reach, and I genuinely believe that I and my family, or my Xbox, entered a parallel universe or something or experienced memory loss from carbon monoxide poisoning, as these explanations do not make sense. Explanation 1, most realistic, me and my cousin were actually playing on my PC. This doesn't make sense, however, as I and him specifically remember playing on the Xbox. We also almost always play on the Xbox when he's here anyways, as it's much easier than getting my laptop out plugging in the HDMI, etc. And also, I remember the message about entering a disc coming up. An explanation too, which is very far-fetched. After a while, out of autopilot, I maybe saw the disc ejected and put it back in its case, but then forgot. This obviously doesn't make sense. I would have remembered something like this, even if it was autopilot, due to the seriousness of the situation my Xbox potentially being broken. Also, 
I remember my sister opening the game case and seeing no game in there. She also opened all the other game cases just in case. I'm not here for an explanation. Although, if you have one, I would love to hear it. I'm just here to share my story, as I recently heard of this subreddit due to a podcaster mentioning reading stories off here. Throughout my young life, I had experienced many instances of what some may call déjà vu. Fleeting moments when I had a strange feeling of seeing something for the first time, as well as having a sense of experiencing it before. For me, it was even hearing or thinking a specific thought while seeing something that I swear I've experienced before. The most notable occurrence was when me and my two high school buddies decided to spar each other in the basement with some fresh boxing gloves. We decided not to go full force because we had at least a slight respect for each other's health. Anyway, a few matches in, my friend landed a hard, solid hit to my temple. My head jerked to the right, and when my vision steadied, I was looking at a recliner chair. My poor friend thought that he really hurt me because I froze instantly. The hit was jarring, but I froze because not only do I remember seeing the exact image, I remember dreaming it at some point. Strange, but I just chalked it up to my brain being dumb and remembering and experiencing it at the same time. However, that all changed one night during my senior year of high school something beyond deja vu that changed my entire view of reality. Not too long after said sparring match, I found myself walking down a dimly lit hallway with white string lights running down either side along the roof. I kept walking, and I could see a strange sight. At the end of the hall was my current math teacher sitting all alone at a folding table. We exchanged pleasantries, and he reached out for my hand. I gave it to him, and he wrote the symbol for the absolute power of X, so pipe symbol X, pipe symbol, on the top of my hand in Sharpie. He then proceeded to write another math-related symbol on someone next to me. I looked at the symbol again, and that's when a loud sound started piercing the air. I awoke to my alarm clock ringing for my usual wake-up time. I cleared it, and sat there groggily repeating my dream in my head, and having a quick mental chuckle on how weird it was before proceeding with my day. A few months later was my senior prom. I didn't care much for dances, but it was a big deal for my girlfriend at the time, so I tried my best to make it special for her. So there we were taking an elevator to the top floor of a tall building downtown. We stepped off the elevator into a dimly lit hall, with white string lights running its length along the roof. At this time, I remember a small nagging feeling in the back of my head, but I'm too caught up on the occasion to pay it any heed. At the end of the hall sat my current math teacher, Apparently, he was put in charge of taking tickets and marking people's hands so they can come and go from the venue. I greeted him as we walked up, and that nagging feeling was becoming quite distracting. As you can probably guess by now, after he took our tickets, he then motioned for my hand and started writing. Yep, there it was. An X sandwiched between two vertical lines. He then proceeded to write the other symbol for my dream on my girlfriend's hand. The nagging feeling had stopped. In its place was reality shattering confusion and fear. This was no, hmm, that's funny, I feel like I've been here before. I immediately remembered the dream without a doubt. Not to mention the two symbols that took it from a possible crazy coincidence to something unexplainable. All of this hit me at once, so on the outside, I had froze, staring at my hand. My teacher and girlfriend noticed and asked if I was okay. I stared for a few more seconds and said, Sorry, 
yeah, and proceeded to the left where the entrance line was. Me being still visibly shaken, and my girlfriend inquired again. She wasn't the overly skeptical type, so I decided to try and explain. Her overall reaction was basically, huh, weird. I then decided to drop it and continue the night normally, due to it being important to her. Of course, in the back of my mind, there was a mixture of excited and scared. Later on, a disappointment joined my new reality. If I had dreamed of my future, clearly that means that our destinies are predetermined, and that bothered me. No matter what I do, everything is all written out. Is choice even really a thing? However, as I looked into paranormal topics along the same line, some new theories popped up that eased some of my new depressing views of reality. For example, instead of seeing my future, I was glimpsing into a parallel timeline slash dimension where the only noticeable difference is the other me went to my prom months earlier. On the other hand, if I did see my future, maybe it was circumstances that were to come true along my current path, but were not set in stone. Kind of rafting down a river and getting a view of a particular bend. You'll get there if you still decide to raft, but at any time you have a choice to take a different branch or leave the river entirely. At that point, I could have a precognition of something major down that path, the newest concept being simply a glitch in the Matrix, but who knows. Those are concepts I cling to in order not to sink into some form of nihilism. <laughs> For me, my reality is forever changed. I don't expect readers or listeners to believe me outright because, at the end of the day, it was all in my head. I can only give my word as someone who wants to get my story out there to hopefully connect with others who share something similar and or figure out this mystery. Since prom night, I have had no similar undeniable moments of precognition. Just smaller ones that could be chalked up to dumb brain. I have a suspicion that it's due to pain pills I had to start taking regularly due to a chronic condition, I have a strong feeling that, if my head was clearer, this ability would have continued or progressed. Maybe life had to nerf me due to me seeing too much. <laughs> Anyways, thanks for reading. Side note, I tried to reach out to my ex-girlfriend through her sister to see if she remembers the symbol on her hand that night. Unfortunately, I haven't heard back. And I didn't want to push it because it's a weird thing to ask after years of no contact. Hello all. This is probably not as shocking as some of the other glitch stories on this channel, but it still blows my mind after over eight years. When I had just moved to Hamburg, Germany in 2013, I did what most 20-somethings do. I partied. A lot. So yeah, to prefix this, I was drunk at the time of the event. Very much so. But let me tell you that being totally wasted could not have caused this weird and random glitch. Since it's kind of hard to describe, and includes rather saucy circumstances, I hesitated a long time to write this down. I'll try my best to be precise. So, I was out and about one night, meeting a guy that I immediately hit it off with, and in the early morning hours, we decided to go to the beach and have some fun. It was about 7 or 8 a.m. on Sunday morning, and we pretty much had the beach to ourselves. We got down to business rather quickly, so I pulled my spandex and thonged down to my high heel ankle boots. Mind you, these ankle boots were tied with shoelaces, and I never took them off during the entire endeavor. Once we finished, I tried to get dressed again. Shouldn't have been a problem, right? 
We never changed positions from me over him or him behind me. So I basically just had to pull up my thong and pants. Easy as pie. Only, it wasn't. This was when the glitch presented itself. My leggings and the boots were still as they were before. I was wearing both shoes, safely tied up, and my spandex were around both legs as usual. The thong was what dumbfounded me. I had only one leg still in it, the other part completely hanging loose between my legs. This could only have happened if I unlaced and took off my right shoe with the respective pant leg, pulled my right leg out of the thong and then put pant leg and shoe back on, tied it, and kept going. Which is quite an operation to follow through while busy with, well, you know. To get dressed again, I actually had to take off my shoes and pants in order to get my leg into my panties again. To this day... I have no rational explanation as to how this could have happened. I am a little scatterbrained, and I was intoxicated with alcohol, but still, that could not have happened by accident or incidentally without me noticing. My underwear wasn't ripped or altered in any way, and I definitely put it on correctly before. At that time, I had never really heard of glitches in the Matrix and just brushed it off as odd. But... Over the years, I have paid more and more attention to the weirdness of reality. And I think what happened that morning can only be a weird jam-up in our simulation. This happened somewhere between the early to mid-2000s. I was a kid, but old enough to remember a few things from that day. Backstory. Every single Sunday for most of our childhood, my dad would take my sister and I to a local forest to let off some steam, and so that my mom could have a few hours to herself. We would go from around 10am to 1pm, and had a regular route that my dad, and even us kids, knew by heart. The day this happened, we parked in the car park and headed up the steep incline that leads to the forest as normal. You can either walk across the car park toward a short, flat trail around the pond, or head up into the proper forest, which is what we always chose to do. Once we were up the incline, my sister and I were free to run ahead, as long as my dad could still see us. Something I usually took advantage of, apart from this day. As soon as we were in the trees, I noticed immediately that something felt off. I couldn't put it into words any more than that. All I knew in my kid brain was that the forest felt different, and I instinctively knew that I should stay close to my dad. I still walked ahead of him and my sister, but only by a few steps. The way I can think to explain the feeling is, is wary. Like when you have to go to bed on your own as a kid after watching a scary film. It wasn't flat-out terror, but I was jumpy and on alert. There was an atmosphere in those trees. I hadn't felt it before and haven't felt it since. I can't remember much more of the walk, just that it felt different the entire way, but I definitely remember the end of it. Remember how I said there's a short trail around a pond? We'd hit our marker and were about to go onto that trail that leads back around the car park, but the path wasn't there. My dad was almost spinning in circles trying to find this path. He had no problem finding it for years, and my feeling was confirmed. He turned to me and my sister and was explaining to us how weird it was that the path was not there. And then he turned to look again, and there it was. As soon as we saw that path and the pond and people again, the funny feeling disappeared. We still talk about it to this day. Whenever my dad and I talk about weird stuff, we always mention how we have our own story. It always starts along the lines of, Do you remember when the path disappeared at the place? He didn't have the funny feeling that I had until the path thing happened. 
and I told him about it later. But he did experience something himself while we walked that day. He remembers seeing a man in a red beanie ahead of us, at one point, who suddenly vanished, somewhere that it wasn't possible to vanish like that. So, yeah, that's my unexplainable story. It's not as exciting as most on here, but it's certainly a core memory for me, and something that definitely kick-started my interest in the unexplained. So, it was 2008 or 2009. I can't remember exactly. It was around the time that the USA was phasing out antenna TVs, and there was that huge push to get the digital converter boxes. I'm sure a lot of you remember this. So, like many people, my family only had cable in the living room, and all of our other TVs, including the one in my bedroom, needed the converter boxes. The converter boxes finally come in, and I am tasked with hooking them up in my room, my parents' room, and my sister's room. I get them all hooked up, and all is well the first day. The next day, I noticed that periodically my TV would get a large black box that would appear perfectly centered in my TV and would take up about 60-70% to 70 of the screen and all anyone could see was the outer border. This would happen multiple times daily, and only ever to my TV and my converter box. My parents didn't want to go through the hassle of replacing it, so I just had to deal with it. Fine. Months go by, and my best friend would come over to hang out all the time. We would play games and watch TV daily so he has also seen the strange box that appeared on my TV multiple times. Then the news is on, and I remember it was some interview with Reverend Al Sharpton. I don't recall exactly what it was about, but my friend and I both disagreed, and were just acting obnoxiously and talking general crap about Al Sharpton, whatever he was harping on about. It was immediately after that, that the black box takes over the screen, except, this time, in white letters and all caps inside that box, it reads, SHUT UP, with at least eight exclamation points. We were both stunned and just immediately stared in silence at the screen. It wasn't subtitles, it wasn't closed captioning, it wasn't an hallucination, Someone somehow inserted those letters on my screen at the exact moment on purpose. Who it was, or what the purpose is, I have never known. And it's driven me crazy thinking about it all these years. The message stayed on the screen for at least two full minutes, and then just disappeared. And this was the catalyst for both of us to start our journey through all things strange and conspiracy-related, and I've never read anything similar happening to anyone else. We tore apart the converter box later that night, looking for any kind of transmitter device or microphone, but we couldn't find anything of the sort. Of course, we had no experience with those things and were teenagers, so it's entirely possible something was there that we just missed. I put the box back together and plugged it back in just waiting and hoping for another message to appear, or something that would come from it, but it never did. Neither of us have ever forgotten about it, though, and we both wish we could know how it happened and why. In December of 2017... We needed to get Christmas stockings for our first holiday living on our own as a new family of three. Being that our son was also one year old just the week before Christmas, and we had a trip planned to see the family, the budget was tight. I decided to settle on some cheap throwaway stockings made of felt that I figured we would just use to get us through this first holiday, and if they didn't hold up, or I wanted something else going forward, no big deal. 
My husband's stocking had a felt sant on it, with a glued-on snowflake embellishment on the toe to the sock. It was the last stocking of its design that wasn't messed up in some way or other, then hanging a bit shorter than the others. I was glad to have found it because it was also the last way I could find a matching set of three all in the same style. Our son had a reindeer with a scarf embellishment, mine had a snowman with a hat embellishment. Around two weeks into having them, my husband notices just one of the spokes on the snowflake embellishment is missing. Thinking our son messed with it and probably got it folded back or tucked behind itself somehow, I got up to investigate. Not only was it not just creased down, I really got in there trying to be sure to the point that I was worried I would undo the hot glue holding the entire snowflake on. It was snipped. It was a clean cut straight across like a pair of scissors. Furthermore, I found the now cut off spoke on the floor beneath where the stocking hung. And we talked about how it was weird that it seemed trimmed off, and that it's a bummer because, even for being cheap, they made quite the cute trio. I threw the dismembered piece away because it was honestly just not even worth saving. It wasn't a big enough deal to me. A week and a half or so goes by when my husband is again the whistleblower. This time, he's telling me the spoke is back, and asking me when I got a new stocking. Confused, I go to grab the stocking and show him closer since clearly his eyes needed some help. I'm walking over to pick it up while telling him that I didn't get a new stocking, so he's obviously mistaken and just seeing things. Sure as hell, it's there. I tug on the piece that we both saw on the floor, and both saw me throw away. It's solid, like it never was detached. There's no evidence whatsoever that it was repaired, even though that wouldn't have been possible either. My husband didn't replace it either to mess with me. It was the same short, off-kilter hang that it always had, and was unique to that specific one in comparison to even the others at the store an error in processing that made it obvious that it was THE stocking. We still have the questionable Santa stocking, and it has had its complete snowflake ever since its mysterious return. Major event? Maybe not. But the fact that it was experienced by two other people at the same time, during both instances, makes it interesting, at the very least. So this happened about four years ago, but me and my boyfriend, now fiancé, remember this exactly the same and still have no explanation. We had just moved into our first house, and for an idea of the layout, when you walk through the front door, the living room, dining room, and kitchen are all one room, and you have a visible view of the sliding glass door that goes to the back porch when you walk in the front. On the outside, if you walk through the carport, there's a screen door that also enters the back porch. It was a pretty small house, so walking from the car to the front door takes like 10 seconds tops. For context, soon after we moved in, we rescued a dog, Athena, a 9-month-old Sharpe. We had only had her for a couple of days at this point, and she was not house-trained. She would run if she got the chance to get through the door. And there were times where I spent hours chasing her down the neighborhood when she would slip through my legs. She was also very skittish, and didn't like interaction at the time because of her former situation. The only way to lock our sliding glass door was to jam a PVC pipe on the tracks so it couldn't be opened from the outside. The screen door on the porch was also locked, and the screen was higher up, and the bottom part was blocks. Okay, now to the nitty gritty. We needed to get groceries for our new house, and couldn't leave the dog inside because of the fact that she wasn't house trained yet. She would go everywhere and rip everything apart. It had happened once already. It was a cool night, and the back porch had a fan, 
so we put her on the back porch with her food, waterbed, and the fan going. And we went to the grocery store a few blocks away. When we got home, we walked in with the groceries, left the front door open, and had to make several trips to and from the car. Each time, we walked out together and walked in together, and each time she was sitting there looking at us through the window, or playfully jumping at the door. Each time, I would stop and playfully jump back towards the window. Well, the very last bit of groceries we were bringing in through the front door, we both stopped dead in our tracks. She was inside, walking from the sliding glass door. It looked as if she just walked right through it. We both looked at each other confused. We were never out of each other's sight, so neither of us could have let her in without the other seeing it. The PVC was still jammed in the door, and it was tightly shut still. We went to the screen door, and it was still locked. We checked for any holes or opening in the screen and the back porch, but there were none. Thinking back, even if she would have gotten out from the back porch somehow, she would have just run away. We checked and pondered any possibility, but it just didn't make any sense. We still have her to this day. She's five years old and is the best good girl ever. She's house-trained, no longer skittish, and is very happy and healthy. When I was 17 years old, my friend and I had a really fun Saturday. She had a convertible Volkswagen, and we would drive around playing music and talking. We are still friends and have always had really good talks about the paranormal universe, even as teens. I've actually always been intuitive and had paranormal interactions, as has she. Anyway, she ended up coming to my house, and I'm the oldest of five kids. My bedroom was actually a breezeway that people would walk through to get to the garage, basement, and laundry room. So, usually if a friend slept over, we slept in the TV room, which had two sliding glass doors into the dining room. If you walked through the dining room, you would get to the kitchen, and then there was a wall so you couldn't see if anyone was sitting at the kitchen table until you walked in. It was the 90s, so... We didn't have cell phones, so no alarm, and there was a clock that chimed on the hour in the TV room. The clock chimed and we both woke up on the two couches and talked for a few minutes about our Sunday plans. Some of our friends had mentioned wanting to go to the beach, so we figured we would go call them. The clock said 8am when it chimed. We got up and walked into the kitchen, but no one was awake. Four small kids, and two parents just still asleep at 8am wouldn't have made much sense. And so, we look at the clock in there, and it says 6.30am. Okay, maybe the clock in the TV room was wrong. We both go and lie back down talking for a few, and then decide to go back to sleep, and wake up to call our friends about the beach later. We wake up this time because my sister comes into the room excited to see my friend. We hear the two sliding glass doors open, and she comes in waking us up loudly. So we trudge into the kitchen and my mother and father are sitting looking tired, and they say, oh, Sorry they woke up so early today. We kept her out as long as we could. She's been up since 5am. I look quickly to the clock, and it's 6.15. I'm so confused, but then sometimes I have lucid dreams and very vivid dreams, so I assume that I dreamt the thing before. We chat for a minute, and I ask my friend if she's ready to call our friends, and she just says, Uh, no, I have to go. She leaves in a hurry. When I called her later to check in because I thought maybe something had happened, she said, You're gonna think I'm crazy, but and she proceeded to tell me exactly what I experienced. She had experienced it, and I laughed and explained that I had the same thing happened and thought that I had just been lucid dreaming. We're now almost 40, 
and we still talk about that day and theorize on why and how it happened to both of us. We haven't told many people because when we did, our friends just thought that we made it up, and our families just said that we probably smoked too much pot. But we know that there was some sort of glitch that happened, and it leads me to where I am today. These events happened in 2011, and I still don't have a logical explanation. I was doing a year abroad on the south coast of Britain to learn English. We were students between 16 to 18 years old living in host families, so we didn't have much money or anything to do besides chilling outside or going to the beach in our free time. A Friday afternoon, we met two students from another school at the beach, and they asked us, my best friend and I, if we wanted to join them for a drinking night near their campus tonight. We said yes and invited some of our friends to the evening. Some of us wanted to go home to take a shower or change their clothes, but me, my best friend, and two men of our friend group were living too far so we decided to go to the park next to the campus and wait there for everyone as the weather was perfect. We didn't know this place. At all. We walked for 30 minutes from the beach following our new friend's instructions. We were staying on a bench in the middle of a big park, and then my best friend and I went for a walk, because we needed to pee. We were chatting and laughing, I remember the sky because it was sunset at golden hour, and we wanted to explore the park a little bit, and because it had a beautiful garden. I remember seeing a green maze and asking my best friend to go there, and, and nothing else. With my best friend, we woke up at 8.30am in her bed, in her host family's home. We were wearing pajamas, feeling great and there was nothing messy in the room. What the hell? We opened Facebook to ask everybody what happened last night, and nobody had an answer. The problem is, we had a reputation of being outgoing and unpredictable, so when they didn't see us coming back, the boys didn't take it seriously and started drinking, not giving a damn about us. Later, other people joined and everybody thought that we were back home. We didn't know the road from the park to her home. We didn't have smartphones or maps. And we didn't have money for a taxi or public transportation. Some more information. It is 12 hours of complete memory loss. The sunset was at 8pm. Alcohol was present, but we hadn't been drinking yet. There were no drugs, and we were all underaged students. Every house and road looks the same in this city, and we didn't know the neighborhood. My best friend's host family did not hear us coming back. There was no injury, no hangover or dizziness, and it happened at Gildridge Park plus Manor Gardens. But what gives me goosebumps is that I don't see the maze anymore on the maps. Ten years later, it still bothers me. We were best friends in England, but we haven't seen each other since. I managed to find her on Instagram and asked her if that's all in my head, or if she is also still freaked out about the story. She has no explanation, and tries not to think about it anymore. I'm glad because some people don't believe my story, and those screenshots are just little evidence. So what's your theory? What exactly happened? I'll preface this with a little personal background. I was an all-state vocalist in New York, and have done national and international competitions in NYC, Cincinnati, Toronto, DC, etc. And that was a bit over 10 years ago, and have been using my voice for recreational singing daily since. But, 
I've been sick with recurring pancreatitis for around six months now, and this was when things started getting a lot stranger for me. I was in the hospital first for five days, and then I was okay for three months before my next round with the beast. The second time, in early February, I was admitted due to extreme pain and not being able to keep water down. Things were very askew because I was being pumped full of drugs for the pain, since that's all they can really do. 11 out of 10 pain though, for sure. Anyways, after 5 days in the hospital this time, I was not feeling well when I got home. I was heavy into withdrawal and was not okay for about 5 more days. I got better though, and when I did, I didn't notice anything odd. I was going back to work, and on my first day back, I was struck again with that same pain. I knew it was starting over again, and I ended up back in the hospital for four more days. Now, that was three attacks in as many months. My whole life has changed. My diet, attitude, etc., due to needing to adjust for my condition. But things started to stick out to me that were different now. Most notably, my voice has gotten deeper. It seems weird, and it wouldn't be too noticeable if it weren't me, but being so intimately in tune with my voice through my whole life, I could tell the next morning when I woke up from my last stay. Before that, I was on pain medication that were sickeningly strong constantly. The doctor said to me, sort of jokingly I guess, that the nurses here had a tendency to stop people's breathing. I'm pretty sure it's because they're liberal with dosing regardless. Second, my best friend of 28 years called back to something that I don't remember. Three times so far. And then I have a memory that he doesn't have. Third, before I went in the first time, during a work meeting, we were told about how the unpaid time off that we got would be changing. Two months after the first happening in January, I needed to take two hours off one of the days and needed to let the boss know so he could adjust the PTO according to the new policy. He said he didn't know what I meant, and that no, I wouldn't lose a whole day for taking the time off. We got three days where if we missed any time, it would count as one of those days, and you could just stay home at that point, but it was only three for the entire year as of the first of that year. I asked him what he meant, and then recalled the meeting, and he had no recollection of the policy or the meeting. I've asked the only co-worker that I work with directly, and he doesn't remember either. So, that's it so far. I'll update if anything else ever comes up, if anyone is interested. Yesterday, my boyfriend and I were enjoying the beautiful day, and we decided to take up a walk up to the local Cumberland Farms to grab some iced coffees. Nothing out of the ordinary. That was until on the walk back home. I want to explain the layout of the area briefly, so you can kind of understand. So, there is our street, and at the end there's a blinking light, and then a pretty big corner on the left side if you're coming out of our street, and then you're on a pretty busy main road where the Cumberland Farm is. As we were walking back down the main road and rounding the corner to get onto our street, a white Mercedes-Benz car came flying behind us around that corner. I get it. The person was probably looking at a car ahead, etc., and it's kind of a blind corner and cars do come around it fairly fast. What's crazy is that we didn't even hear it. Something inside of me just said to turn around, and as I did, the person, who was a woman with dark hair and a red shirt on, was swerving to avoid us. My boyfriend and I both saw the car, and we both saw the woman that was driving it, 
It was almost as if time had slowed down for just that brief moment. I said, Holy crap, that car almost hit us. His reply was, Yeah, that white bends? We brushed it off. We kept walking, talking, didn't really think much of it. We were about 800 yards from our house when a woman with dark hair and a red shirt on was bringing in her garbage cans. You can tell she was most likely just getting back from work, still had her work badge on, and this was around 6pm. We live in a pretty small, friendly little community. The side her house is on is directly on the lake. We say hello, and she says, I'm so sorry. I didn't mean to scare you guys back there. I didn't even see you. We said that it was okay and that it's definitely a blind spot. And we all laughed it off, and the boyfriend and I kept walking towards our home. Now, this is the weird part. The houses that are on the lakeside have literally the smallest driveways, basically non-existent, and pretty much no lawn either, so no garage. Nowhere for a car to be pulled around, and nothing. This particular home, the woman's home with the red shirt, honestly gives off more of a summer cabin kind of home, if that makes any sense at all. Anyways, there were two cars in the little parking area of her home, a bright red, and I mean apple red, and an ugly green one, more on the dark side. Both are colors that you don't really see. I'm not sure on the exact type of car that they were, but they were both the same, besides the color. Ugly cars, I want to add, Definitely nowhere near what a Benz looks like. Not even close. And more like what a Prius looks like. My boyfriend was the one that made the comment and said, I thought it was a white Mercedes that almost hit us. I was so dumbfounded. I kept looking back, trying to justify what just happened. It was a thousand percent the same woman, but a totally different car? I mean, these cars' body shapes were so beyond different that... There's no way we could have possibly mixed it up. Not to mention the color. A bright apple red and a Mercedes white. I woke up this morning still trying to rationalize this mix-up, and no matter how logical I try to be, I just can't. I'm a 60-year-old male and recently retired from my job. I live in the same town where I was born. It's a small town of only 30,000 people, so I know this place well. I live alone and still get up at 5.30 every morning. I take a shower, shave, dress, and I'm usually out the door a little after 6. About a month ago, something happened that I can't get out of my mind. I drove about two miles from my home to a small diner for breakfast. I have always used the drive through even before COVID. I don't like to eat in public alone, so I take my meal home. In this particular morning, in addition to being dark, it was foggy and cold. So I turned on the heater in the car and drove carefully through the fog to the diner. In this time of morning, there's little traffic, so... It usually only takes me about five minutes or so to get there. They know me at this diner, and they're always friendly and quick with my order. Nothing happened out of the ordinary on the way to the diner or while I was there. It was on the way home that something went wrong. I turned off of a large four-lane causeway into a small neighborhood that borders the development that I live in. I always drive slowly through here because there are a lot of children and pets in this neighborhood. I normally drive about 500 feet past a dozen small houses on each side of the road to a four-way stop sign where I turn left. This intersection is well lit by two bright streetlights. A policeman lives in this corner, and he always parks his police car under one of the streetlights. This reminds everyone to stop at the sign and to slow down. Only, this morning, I didn't see the intersection, nor the streetlights, or the police car. I'm driving along, and I realize I should be at the stop sign. 
Then I notice the fog is thicker now and I can no longer hear the sound of my car heater fan blowing. I feel the heat, just no sound. I also don't hear the engine or the humming of my tires on the road. I don't recognize the houses on either side of the street either, and they seem to be moving closer to the road. I get the feeling they're trying to crowd around me. I want to turn back, but a voice tells me, Keep going. Don't turn around. I arrive at a fork in the road. This fork, which I have never seen before, is lit by a dim streetlight and has a yield sign that looks very old. It's one of those yellow ones with black letters that I remember from my childhood. It's rusty and leaning to one side, like it's been hit a couple of times. The voice says, take the right fork. This time I just do it. Now, the houses have disappeared. It's just me alone in my car with the fog, the silence, and the cold darkness. I'm about ready to scream when I see a very bright light ahead, and the voice says, Drive to the light. I still want to turn around, but somehow I keep moving forward. I trust the voice now. I'm relieved to discover that the light is coming from a convenience store at a familiar intersection. Only this intersection is at the opposite end of the street that I just turned onto, off the causeway. I've covered a distance of two miles in under a minute. How this happened, I don't know, but I turn towards my house. At this point, I can hear the heater fan again, and I kind of smile at the humming sound my tires make on the road. I arrive home safely, ate my breakfast, and tried to forget what just happened to me. And I'm still trying to forget it, but I don't think I ever will. I've written this experience out many times before. It was a while ago, so most Reddit channels dealing with glitches always remove it, quoting a rule about not posting childhood experiences, because of the possibility of misremembering. But recently, I found an old journal from back before the internet was even a thing. Back when, if you wanted to record something... You actually needed a pen and paper and to do it by hand. It was my book of weird experiences. This one was in there. So I've since updated it and clarified some things that I've been asked before. I will say that this took place a long time ago in a universe far away. And this event haunts me to this day. It's actually the reason I never got into sports, especially football. In high school, in gym class, we were playing flag football. I admit I wasn't very good and therefore wasn't liked by my peers. I was an outsider anyways, so this is what led to what happened. The kids must have thought it would be funny to throw the ball, not to me, but at me, when my back was turned. You know that feeling you get when you somehow know someone is looking at you? and then you turn to see someone is? Well, I got that feeling. I turned to see the football hurtling towards my head. Now, I know how this will sound, and it's what bothers me the most, simply because if anyone else said it, I'd call BS as well. But the ball froze, in midair. I thought it was just a mental thing, only from my perception, but then I noticed the other kids were standing there looking at this football frozen in the air, puzzled. They weren't frozen. Nothing else was. The looks on their faces were something between fear and confusion. As we stood there, the coach yelled something. He then saw what we were gawking at, and his look was similar. We stood there for about two or three moments. It was surreal. It wasn't caught on a line, and it wasn't in an updraft or anything. I remember that day. It was overcast and growing gloomy, but it wasn't a windy, stormy, or nothing like that. I was hoping for foul weather or anything to avoid gym class outside, and that just didn't happen. That Neanderthal of a coach didn't care anyways. Now, to clarify, the football was thrown from about 20 feet away, 
It was thrown in a spiral arch that was directly on course with my head. When it paused, it was just coming down from the arch about 10 to 15 feet away, and I would say 12 feet off the ground. Back to what happened next, as I moved from my spot where I had been standing, gawking at the ball, the ball just unpaused the moment that I moved out of its path. I was promptly told by the coach that I was out of the game and to sit on the sidelines, something I was more than happy to do. The kids and coach just went back to playing as normal. I got side-eye glares from all the kids there that day. I was given two study hall class and replacement to gym after that. I was a kid who hated gym anyways, so I didn't ask why. Years later, I saw the movie The Matrix. When Neo stopped the bullets, I got goosebumps. But in my experience, I didn't do it on purpose, nor had I raised my hand or done anything dramatic. I wish I knew any of those kids today, and I'll see if there's a way I could find one, but my experiences with glitches like this is people block it or get updates. I hadn't heard of the term glitch, or read any user stories when this occurred, but since then have listened to and read lots on YouTube and Reddit, so I decided to share my own. This was so simple and mundane, but to me proves that glitches are real, and I believe anyone who says they have experienced them. This was around springtime of 2019. I made a note of it. I was sat in the living room on a Friday evening, watching TV. My then-teen daughters had just gone to bed, as had my partner, who asked if I would bring a cup of tea up in the adverts, or when the TV program finished, and I also retired. I went into the kitchen, boiled the kettle, made a cup of tea, and then came back into the living room and put the cup of tea on the table next to me intending to take it up to her, after I watched the current bit of program. At some point, I must have then dozed off into a fairly light sleep, as sometimes happens on a Friday evening after a week of work. Suddenly, I was woken by a loud thud noise. I jolted awake and opened my eyes. In front of me, about two meters away and slightly off-center of the middle of the room, was a cup. It was an empty cup, not one of the regular cups we have, but my partner's special, slightly larger cup she sometimes uses for different types of tea. It was bone dry, no liquid in it. The other cup of tea that I had made was still next to me, with the tea, now slightly cooler, still in it. I had not brought this other cup into the living room and put it into anything such as the sofa where it could have fallen off and made the noise. So, basically, this cup, which was kept in a cabinet in the kitchen next door, had jumped or materialized from the kitchen cupboard to this room and fallen onto the floor, waking me up. From the noise of the thud, I gathered that it had fallen at least handheld height, as if someone had carried it and let go of it. And no, it was impossible for my partner or the kids to have done this to play a prank, because the room door was shut, and it would be impossible to do this because of the layout of the room. Also, I checked shortly afterwards, and they were all in bed asleep. I took stock for a moment and deliberately took note of where I was sat, and where the cup was, and other things in the room so I would not be confused and would remember how things were laid out in said room. Then, I got up and put the cup back in the cupboard in the kitchen, made a fresh cup of tea, and went up to bed. Nothing like this has happened before or since. I don't know what or if it actually meant anything in terms of the universe, like a sign to take the cup of tea up to my partner instead of watching the TV, or if it was just a glitch in how the universe works. 
even though it was so simple, just an object jumping from one room to another, I am thankful to the universe in a way for letting me experience a true, verifiable glitch. The only thing I'm disappointed about is that I was not awake to see how the cup actually appeared when it did. I've always thought that there was more to the universe and existence than we think, and always believed in the supernatural, although I never had any explanation or proof for it. I think that what people term the supernatural could in fact be examples of, or related to, glitches like this that we notice. Who knows what the true nature and meaning of reality is, but these glitches suggest that there is more to it than we understand. I'm a 55-year-old man, and my daughter suggested that I submit one of my glitches to this podcast, as she is an avid listener. I've had many glitches happen throughout my life, but the one that I always tell, and that leaves me feeling crazy, is one like the movie Premonition. This happened when my eldest daughter, let's call her Diane, was in college. She was a first-generation student and had a full-ride scholarship, so our family was very proud. While in college, she met her first boyfriend, she never dated in high school, Isaac. Isaac was a junior engineering major when we met him, and even met his parents during his and Diane's one-year anniversary celebration. He lived in the town where they went to college, and my family and I were two hours away, and to know that Diane had somewhere close to go in case of trouble was comforting. The glitch happened during St. Patrick's Day of Diane's sophomore year. So, although Diane had a full scholarship, she worked a part-time job at a retail store for extra cash, and that day she was working until close and had asked if I could send her some money before work, as she was between paychecks. Her mother sent it, and Diane texted me that she received the money and thanked me. She said she would text tomorrow as she said she had to pick up Isaac to be a DD for him, and she would spend the night there. Diane wasn't a partier, so I never worried about her drinking and driving or getting into predicaments. About 4 or 5 a.m., I got a call from the police department in Diane's town asking for her parents. I told them that it was us, and he informed us that Diane had been in an accident and was at the hospital in the town over from her college. He said he didn't have any information and that we needed to go there as the ER team was busy with life-saving measures. Within minutes, my wife and I packed up our other three daughters and flew the two and a half hours to the town they said Diane was at. We got a hold of the hospital, and they said they couldn't release information over the phone, but told us how to get there and which side of the hospital to go to. When we got there in a rush, we were told to go up to a top floor, and that Diane was there, as she and Isaac were taken into the trauma unit. When those elevator doors opened... I had this feeling in my gut that I needed to prepare for heartbreak. My wife and I ran to the desk and asked about Diane. A nurse pointed to a waiting room and said that a doctor would be in. The doctor didn't take long, and gave the worst news that you can get as a parent. Diane didn't make it. They said that she had put up a good fight, but a head injury caused a life-ending seizure when they were intubating her. The doctor gave us his condolences and said that we could see her before the morgue took her and that a social worker would be up to talk to us about moving Diane's body back to the hometown. Seeing my daughter like that is forever seared in my brain. All the tubes and wires and blood everywhere. She looked like her, but not. Isaac's parents stopped over and hugged us as they said Isaac didn't make it either, but... He was killed on impact. Apparently a car full of college-aged girls were driving drunk, 
and turned left at a red light without stopping and went full speed head on with Diane and Isaac. Isaac's parents said the other party's families were there as well, and that of the five girls in the vehicle, four were killed on impact, and the other one was in critical condition. The next day was a blur, and my family was sleep deprived. We didn't want to leave Diane, but we had to make arrangements. Although I was emotional and sleep deprived, I knew that my daughter had died. We never received a call saying she came back. We left the town about 12 that afternoon after talking to a social worker and the police. When we got back, everyone was crying throughout the day, and we made calls to the relatives and our spiritual leaders. We're Native American, and we hold three-day wakes followed by a funeral, and usually it's open casket. After making calls, we realized that we would have to collect Diane's things from her dorm room, which we overlooked in our grief coming home. We called campus housing and explained what happened, and asked her information as we didn't remember her dorm info. The lady was very sympathetic, and gave us the information and said that they would leave a note for when we go there. Now, I had laid down after that call, but I don't remember sleeping or waking up, really. I just remember sitting up, and the atmosphere felt different. I looked at the time, and it was the afternoon. I checked the rooms at the house, and none of my other daughters nor my wife were there. I called my wife, and I asked her where she was, and she said work. I asked why she went to work, and she said because she does every weekday, or was she missing something. There was no grief or sadness, nothing in her voice. I asked her if she remembered last night, and she said, what happened? And then she said, oh, and I sent Diane the money she asked for, just to make sure that she got it. I have to go. Hearing that confused me, but raised my hopes. Diane? Today? I checked my phone, and right when I did, I got a text from Diane saying she got her money, and that she was going to DD Isaac tonight. I called the number half thinking it would just ring, but my other half hoping that she would answer. She answered. To hear her voice made me cry like a baby. Dad? Dad, what's wrong? She asked in a panicked voice. I collected myself and said, Baby, I had a horrible dream about you dying, and I'm being serious. This is weird. I don't know if it was a dream or what happened, but you're alive, and I want you to stay alive. Diane was confused, and I told her that I was on my way over there, and I would take her and Isaac to dinner. I begged her to call in to work, and that we would have a great time. Just to appease me, she agreed. I let my wife know that I was going to see Diane ASAP, and that I would tell her when she got off work. When I got to campus, I decided to check something and went to the housing desk and asked for Diane's information. They said they would give the room a call. I looked over at their desk and saw no note about picking up anything from Diane's dorm. I heard them talk on the phone and they gave me Diane's info. Let me tell you, when she opened the door I hugged her so tight and I did not want to let go. She looked like herself and everything. I still felt sleep deprived from that glitch call, but I was happy. The rest of the evening went well and I went home and explained everything to my wife. We saged ourselves down and prayed for our family's safety. Diane is now 31 with two kids of her own, and every day I'm still afraid that I'm going to glitch again and go into a reality where Diane is gone and my grandkids don't exist. In 2014, I was standing outside on my front porch. Next to my house was a a big green belt slash water retention area. I lived at the end of the street where the street begins to curve to go on to the next street, if that makes sense. So, 
I had a neighbor to the right of me, after the street curved so the neighbor's house was facing east, and my house was facing south, and the green belt was in between the both of our houses. That sounds confusing, I know. Anyway, the entire sky was gray, like it was rainy weather. There was no blue anywhere in the sky, so basically it was just a giant sheet of gray clouds. I noticed that it had started to sprinkle this really weird type of drizzle on the neighbor's house, but not my house, and none of the other neighbor's houses. I knew this because I could see the line of demarcation from where the rain stopped on the sidewalk. This neighbor had another neighbor directly to its right. That neighbor's house was not getting rained on either. I thought it was really odd, but I decided to go in for a second and open the garage to take the trash cans out to the road. So, after I wheeled the trash cans out to the road, I stopped there to look around to see if it was still raining on the neighbor's house. It was not. So I walked out to the green belt because I could hear a rumbling noise. It was like the sound of a dishwasher running but up in the sky. It was a very low rumble, and I couldn't pinpoint where it was coming from other than up, and the noise was spread out so that it wasn't centralized on any one area in the sky. It was just rumbling in the clouds. The noise that it was making was like this ver 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 ver. It's hard to describe a noise through text, but if you can just say that noise out loud, then you might be able to get the idea. Hopefully me saying it out loud did get that idea across as to what it sounded like. Anyway, so I'm standing there looking up at the sky, and the gray blanket of clouds starts parting, and as it's parting, the rumble is getting louder, as if the rumble was coming from up inside these clouds. When I say the clouds were parting, I mean perfectly. Hold your arms straight out in front of you, and put them together, and then slowly start to move them apart from each other. The blanket of clouds was parting, with a perfect line formed straight down the middle of the clouds, and it was opening up, revealing perfectly clear blue sky up inside the clouds. And the rumbling was getting louder the further the part opened. I ran inside to get my phone to take a picture or a video, and my phone died. I had an old cell phone that I tried to use, and I couldn't get it to turn on. I even tried to use my ex-boyfriend's professional camera that he had at my house, but I couldn't figure out how to work it, so I was unable to get any visual proof of what I'm talking about. So I ran back outside to see what was happening, and it began to close the perfect straight line down the middle of the clouds that had opened up and parted perfectly was now closing, and the rumbling sound was getting lighter. It had finally closed back together and the rumbling had stopped. I'm looking around my neighborhood to see if anyone else was standing outside, and there was no one. Absolutely nobody. I was the only person that saw this happen and it was directly over the top of the green belt, in between my house and the neighbor's house. The weird part is, it sounded like the noise was dispersing and reverberating off of a dome structure above the clouds. I don't believe that we are living in a dome, that's just what it sounded like. This happened roughly 10 years ago. I had graduated high school and was about to begin my first semester in college, but I had a few weeks to kill before then. So, I was home alone around 10.45 a.m. Because I had graduated high school, I felt a kind of accomplishment to turn off my alarm clock. It felt great to have a few weeks of freedom of waking up whenever the hell that I wanted, my parents were early risers. My dad, being from former military, woke up around 4.45 a.m. every morning, followed shortly by my mom, whose alarm clock went off around 5 a.m. 
I'm not sure what time my neighbors woke up, but I'm pretty sure they wake up around 6 a.m. as well. I was never fully awake enough to pay attention to alarm clocks of my neighbors. Well, as 11 a.m. rolls around, I decide it's time to prep something to eat, maybe boot up the computer to play some video games. I lived in a single-story, three-bedroom house, so it's not very big, and I can hear everything from the living room or kitchen. By 11.15 a.m., I can hear the distinct sound of my alarm clock. I easily recognize it because it always sends a shiver up my spine. I have to convince myself that I'm in fact not dreaming, and that I did graduate high school. I race to my bedroom and inspect the clock. The alarm switch is set to off. However, it is continuously blaring at me. I hit the snooze button and check the time the alarm is set for, and it's 6am. Once the alarm is silenced, I notice other noise emitting from all around the house. On senior night from high school, we received these commemorative cheap clocks, which had our high school and graduating class year etched into it. It took me a few seconds to realize that its alarm was going off. I had never heard it before and I had no idea it even had an alarm function. I basically had to pull out the battery because I didn't know how to shut it off. I was very confused as I walked out of my bedroom. Further down the hall was my parents' room, and I could hear the distinct wailing of their alarm going off as well. I entered the room and shut off that alarm clock too. After silencing all the alarm clocks in the house, I can hear the distinct wailing of alarm clocks coming from the neighbors as well. I was absolutely frozen in place, trying to figure out what was going on. Why were all the alarm clocks set to go off at the same time in the middle of the day? A few minutes go by, and everything returns to silence. The neighborhood goes quiet again, as I know I'm the only one home out of most of the neighbors. I walk out to the street, straining my ears trying to hear any sound whatsoever, as I could usually hear the sound of a stray car driving by, or the sound of a siren or honking. Nothing. For a good three minutes, it really feels like I am the only person left on Earth before the sounds of traffic begin to build up, and a distant wail of an ambulance goes by, and I'm able to catch my breath again. For the rest of the day, I just sit on the living room sofa staring at the blank TV screen, trying to figure out if it had just been my imagination, a hallucination, dream, or something else. To this day, I have never experienced anything like that again. As for the alarm clocks, I quickly disposed of my own before going to college, and I'm not sure about my parents' one, but I don't live there. But after a few years had gone by, my mom did mention that the alarm clock was broken and they had to get a new one. We sometimes just talk about random stuff. So, at the end of the last school year, my daughter, I'll call her Grace, graduated elementary school. As the kids were saying goodbye to their friends for the summer, some of the parents were standing around and exchanging numbers so the kids could set up times to see each other. One of my daughter's closest friends, let's call her Kate, is being raised by her grandparents. Well, grandmother and step-grandfather. The grandfather introduced himself as Bob and asked to exchange numbers, which we did. I didn't talk to the grandmother as she was turned away talking to someone else, and I didn't get a good look at her. A couple weeks later, we had arranged for the girls to get together. I went to their house to drop off Grace. The woman looked familiar to me, and she recognized me. She had dated a man I knew named Bob, but not the Bob that I met and exchanged numbers with. He was a very close friend to one of my close friends. 
let's call my friend Liz. Liz and I did everything together for years. Although we had a falling out and hadn't spoken in about five years or so at this point. But when we were tight, we were always together, and she moved in with me for a few months after her house had burned down. Bob was a member of her church, and a very close friend to her. We were younger than Bob by about 10 to 15 years, but she had a major crush on him, which he didn't return, but still stayed close with her. We went on camping trips together. He was in my house several times. We played cards together. I was at his house several times. So, when I say that I would instantly recognize him on sight, I cannot overstate the fact that there is no way I wouldn't know him if I was standing and talking directly to him. Plus, he would recognize me and would talk to me in a familiar way. So, now the grandmother is standing there reminding me how much we know each other. She dated Bob for a bit, she'd played cards at my house, and I'd seen her at his house. It was just a few times, almost a decade ago, but I did recognize her as someone that I knew. And as far as I knew, she and Bob had split up. So when she mentioned her husband, Bob, I thought it was funny that she had married another man named Bob. But it's a common name. And the man I spoke with and introduced himself to me as Bob, like we were meeting for the first time, was not the Bob that I knew. He had snow white hair, and the round paunch that elderly men get. He was soft spoken, and he looked like a generic grandfather. He had no resemblance to the Bob that I knew at all. Except the next time that I saw the grandmother, the girls saw a lot of each other, so we saw each other regularly, she again mentioned Bob, and referenced something the five of us, her, Bob, my husband, and I, along with Liz, had done together. I was confused. She just said that she married the Bob that I knew, I started asking questions in the guise of just catching up. Yep, she meant the Bob that I knew. She told me that they had split when she started taking her grandchildren in, because their mother was neglecting them and she had to fight for custody. She didn't think Bob would want to start over with toddlers to raise them in his mid-sixties. It turns out that he did. He asked her to marry him and raise the children together, which totally sounds like the Bob that I know, but not the Bob that I met at the school and had spoken to, and neither of us recognized each other, which would have been impossible. But sure enough, the next time I was there, Bob was home. Salt and pepper hair, fit for a man in his 60s, rugged, very distinctive looking. He greeted me like I had just seen him the other day, and spoke to me in the familiar way that I would expect from him. This was not the man that I spoke to at the school, and exchanged numbers with. I have no explanation. And no, it wasn't the real grandfather, as the grandmother's first husband had passed away many years before I met her. I stated that he was the step-grandfather at the beginning. I know this is long, sorry. So, who did I talk to? and give my number to if it wasn't Bob. The number I had been using to contact the grandmother and from which she had contacted me was the one that I got. I wish I had gotten a good look at the grandmother that day because I think she wasn't the same person either, but like I said, I didn't get a good look at her so I can't be sure. And why would Bob introduce himself to me like he didn't know me? when we clearly recognize each other on sight. This isn't the only really weird thing that has happened to me, but this one's bothering me a great deal. To be clear, they have no idea about any of this going on. From their point of view, nothing is amiss. There was not a different grandparent or uncle, etc. that was there that day, as the biological grandfather passed away, and the other set is not in the picture. And 
there's no other relatives involved. They're on their own raising four grandchildren. It's not a scam. We live in a very small rural town and everyone knows each other. And the girls have a couple other close friends in the group and the other mother and grandmother, one of the other friends is also being raised by her grandparents, all frequently talk to each other and are constantly shuttling the girls between each house. I will make one note that may or may not have any relevance. My friend Liz knew Bob through church, and the grandmother also attended. That's how they all know each other. They were all very devout and deep into the church and religion, which isn't my scene at all. I made mention of their church, and the grandmother told me they were attending a different church and that they loved, which struck me as unusual considering how into the church community they had been. It would have taken something significant to make them drive 30 minutes to a different church instead of the one in town. Most people change if they have a fundamental difference on doctrine, they don't like the pastor or there's personal drama among the congregation. Which isn't to say that none of these happened. I kind of wonder if my former friend Liz, who had had such a crush on Bob, had made things awkward for them once they got married. Which may be the case. But it's still kind of strange. Edit. I asked one of the mothers whom I'm friendly with, and a grandmother of the girls' friend groups. There's four of them that are close and spend a lot of time together. Both of these women assured me that Bob, the one I have always known, was in fact at the graduation. So, they saw the same Bob as always with the grandmother. The grandmother who was raising one of the other girls had known them for a bit, as their granddaughters had youth group together. The other mom had met them before, but didn't have their number and also exchanged numbers with Bob that day. This is one of the two most mind-blowing glitches I've ever had. I keep not posting it because I'm verbose and it might be long, so here goes. My friend and I were tall, smart, long-haired men in the mid-80s. Tight blue jeans, blue jean jacket. We were 100% sober going to the local lake for a smoke. Maple Lake was roughly square, maybe 200 feet by 400 feet. East was a dam and cement area to sit, with diving boards. West was a peninsula where the two streams feed into the lake, north corner. North was Berm and the Susquehanna railroad tracks. South was a part paved, part dirt path road with a pavilion and suburbia above a steep hill. There was an object of interest, a pipe made of a deep socket wrench socket and a question mark shaped metal tube that clicked into the square hole of the socket, heavy and metal. We had to make do with what we had back in those days, you know? The incident. We walked west along the south side, and I saw a clump of poplar slash tulip trees that had fallen over into the water. There were multiple bowls slash trunks grown together, a few underwater bowls held two large bowls above the lake, with a three-inch bowl acting like a handrail. I suggested that we go out there. I sat on the east bowl facing west, he was west facing east. Our knees a few inches apart, and our feet were two feet above the water, blue sky above. I handed him the pipe. I felt his hand wrap carefully around it as we were over the lake and didn't want to drop it. I looked down right toward my right pocket as I let go of it, and started to use my left hand to hold my right change pocket open to get the stuff out. Tight jeans. Once out, I looked at my friend. He was doing the same action, using his left hand to pry his front right pocket open to pull out a standard Bic lighter. He got it out, looked at me, and then looked away. After waiting for him to hand me the pipe, I finally said something about it. 
He said he didn't have it. I said that I just handed it to him, and I felt him take it. He said that he started to, but then he reached for his lighter. We repeated this conversation. We then searched ourselves. We then repeated the conversation and the search at least three more times. It hadn't dropped into the water. It was not resting on the branch above our eyes that had been our handrail. The pipe was big, slippery, and heavy. It wouldn't have perched there. It was not in any pockets. I often hooked the socket pair on my left breast pocket when I needed to set it down, and it wasn't there. After these multiple pocket-slash-area searches and frustrated discussion, we finally just both stared at each other with our hands out in a what-the-hell motion as we scrunched our faces in disbelief. Suddenly, it falls from the blue sky above, hits my left thigh, and ricochets past my right knee. Thankfully, I've always had great reflexes, and I snatched it from the air. My friend had seen it fall from above me as we stared at each other. Roughly 23 years later, my friend says, Hey, I wanted to ask, do you remember that day at Maple Lake? And I finished with, And the bull vanished and then fell from the sky? And he was like, I still think about that from time to time, and I wondered if you remembered it. And I said, I'll never forget that moment in time. Thanks for reading. This is 100% true. I could make up a better paranormal tale than this. <laughs> this was just a really weird day. Just a premise. I'm one of the most skeptical people when it comes to the paranormal and I'm often skeptical about the things on this page. However, I've had one inexplicable experience in my entire life that I have to get off my chest, and I remember it to this day so vividly. I've lived in the same city my entire life in the USA, and there was this Circle K convenience store very close to where I lived. At the time, I knew the same four or five employees at the store. The store only has one entrance, which also serves as the exit, and the parking lot in front of the store is the only parking lot. The store also only has one bathroom, which is designed for one person at a time. Back in March of 2011, I drove to this Circle K, and right about the same time, this white car pulled up next to me. I'm not sure what kind of car it was, but it was quite a beater, to say the least. Right when I was getting out of the car, the woman driving the white car had gotten out of it. She walked into the Circle K. I took some time to empty out some trash from my car, and I entered the store about a minute later. Keep in mind, this woman had not left the store yet, and there was only one entrance, which also served as the exit. Aside from the woman who worked there, I was the only one in the main part of the store, so I just assumed the woman that I saw walking from the car was in the bathroom. I got my snacks and went up to the counter. I already knew the clerk well. We would open up to each other about many things, and I had to ask if a woman walked in and was possibly in the bathroom. I just thought it was odd that this woman was using the restroom for close to 10 minutes at this point. Anyways, I described what the woman looked like to the clerk. She was very pale, white, obviously, had black hair, brown eyes. She was medium height, and as soon as I mentioned her very low waist to hip ratio, she had an abnormally large back end and huge hips and thighs compared to her little waist, the clerk gasped. She told me that she knew exactly who I was talking about, and she also told me that she was a regular customer, but what she said to me gives me chills to this day. She told me that this woman had not entered the store on this day. 
I told her that I saw her walk in right before I did, and she told me that she was at the counter and never saw her. We were both baffled. I obviously wasn't just seeing things, because the clerk told me I described a regular customer, and this was somebody that I had never seen before. When I walked out of the Circle K, her car was still there. So I just sat in my car for five minutes, but then left, because I didn't want to seem creepy anyway. I never found out if she came back for that car. The only thing I can think of is the woman from the car walked in the store, was maybe doing something shady in the bathroom, maybe drug dealing or drugs, etc., and was in cahoots with the clerk, and the clerk was just playing dumb with me. Even though I knew the clerk, this doesn't mean she didn't have any secrets that she wouldn't tell me. Other than that, I don't know. She just disappeared into thin air. So, I guess I'm going to start from the time that I went to the hospital in 2015. Apparently, I had high blood pressure and it was dissecting my aorta. I was rushed into surgery to save my life. I was out for two weeks, but within that time I had what I called nightmares. It was two straight weeks of complete terror. Sometimes I experienced myself in my everyday life, but each vision, dream, or nightmare always ended in the very hospital that I was in. Sometimes I woke, and I'm in the morgue, surrounded by bodies, while I was yelling to get attention and nobody could hear me. Other times I was in a completely different life, but I was still me. One, I was a rich entrepreneur nightclub owner, and I'm not the nightclub type. Other times, I was a soldier in Iraq separated from my platoon. I was captured and tortured and forced to denounce America. Another dream, I was trapped in a strange restaurant that I owned and ran. Anyway, let me digress. When I finally came to, I just wanted to see my wife. The nurse said that she was coming and should be there any minute. My wife did end up coming, and when I saw her, I knew it was her, but she looked different. Her weight had changed, and so did her voice. Our memories were mostly on par with slight differences. I just wrote it off as a perception of events, and carried on waiting to be released so I could go home and finally feel safe. So, as I was discharged and sent home with a huge amount of medication and new life rules to live by. They wheeled me down to my wife's car, but only it wasn't the car that I remembered. She owned a Hyundai Tucson, but this new car was a Chevy Equinox. I only knew it was her because I could see her get out to help me in the car. I asked her when she got the new car, and she said that she hadn't. We get home, and she helps me out and into the house. At this point, everything else looked normal. Same furniture, same color walls. So I began to brush things off again, figuring I would eventually circle back to what I had noticed. I asked where the dogs were, and she said that she had put them out so they won't jump on me because of my chest incision. So she got me upstairs and put me in bed and turned on the TV. And that's when I started to notice more strange things. And this stuff cannot be a perception problem. I turned on the TV to watch some news and saw that Donald Trump was running for president. I thought, that's strange, because I remember he had dropped out of the race because the Republicans wouldn't back him, but they seemed to be embracing him. I thought maybe he had decided to just get back in. I was trying really hard to just brush things off now, I started to get anxiety really bad, so I turned off the news and picked one of my favorite movies to watch, The Lord of the Rings. As I was relaxing and getting my mind right, my wife made me something to eat and asked if I was ready or willing to see the dogs. I couldn't wait to see Rue and Riley. 
She opened the bedroom door and called them. They come running up in the bedroom, but instead of being happy to see me, they just stopped, sat and stared at me. There was no welcome home like usual. They acted like I had been there the whole time. Shortly after this, I learned about the Mandela Effect. I can tell you that this is not all the Mandela Effects that I do remember, but some that I do. I don't know what any of this means, but that's my story. I have never in my entire life experienced anything remotely like what has just happened to me now. And also, I'm not crazy. I finished work at around 10.15pm, so it was pitch black and I cycled home. It's roughly a 25 minute cycle back to the house, and as I got into my little town, I was approaching the crossroads in which I go straight ahead at when I'm cycling home. Upon approach to the crossroads, the light is red, but I'm still a good 10 to 15 seconds away from it, so I continue at the speed that I'm going. I see another cyclist coming towards me on the other side of the road from the direction that I'm headed and speed over the crossroad. As he's approaching me, I see he's wearing the exact high-vis helmet and jacket as me, as well as the same red backpack. By this point, the lights had turned amber and then green, so I thanked my luck for not having to stop, and kept going at the same speed that I was going at. Just as I was on approach to the green light, this other cyclist was right in front of me, but on the other side of the road and passing me. As he passes me, he says, Careful, mate. In my voice. My exact voice. Also, I'm not from the country that I live in, so my accent is very unique, and it was the same tone of voice and everything. I stopped my bike and turned around, no traffic behind me as the roads are dead at this time of night, and he had vanished. There was no way he could have turned down a side road or made it so far that he was out of sight. He mysteriously vanished. I turned back around to begin cycling again, and all of a sudden a car sped across the road at around double the speed limit, running a red light. If I hadn't stopped to look at this mysterious person who looked and sounded exactly like me, I'd have been hit side on, and likely died. I don't believe in anything supernatural, and I'm not religious, but this is making me question some things. I think if this person hadn't just vanished after the warning, then I could answer it as a very unlikely event that someone who looks and sounds just like me had maybe seen the car approaching. But he vanished. So, I am kind of reluctant to ask this question, but it's been a mystery that has baffled me for 13 years. So here I go. When I was 21 years old, I lived in my mom's guest house in her backyard. One night, and we got into a horrible fight, one of the worst fights we've ever had. When she went back to her own side of the yard, I closed the doors to my guest house and I locked them, shut all the lights off, and laid down to go to sleep. About an hour later, I got a phone call from her and she asked me what I was doing. I told her I was sleeping. She said, no you're not. I said, yes I am. She said, prove it then. Walk out the front door, come across the yard and meet me in my kitchen, but stay on the phone with me. So, that's what I did. When I walked into her house and into her kitchen, she was staring out her kitchen window across the yard at the side door of my guest house. 
she told me to come over to where she was standing and to look out the window and tell her what I saw. I looked out the window and I saw myself. It wasn't a current version of me, though. It was me my senior year of high school. I knew this because my hair was done the exact way that I used to do it back then, and I was wearing my favorite shirt and matching shoes that I used to have back then as well. I was sitting on a chair that I actually did have sitting outside the door of my house in the side yard. I was talking to people that were not there. We saw nobody else. And I was smoking a cigarette. I also used to smoke back then. I had my legs crossed and I was laughing and having a good time. I also kept looking over at the window where my mom and my actual self were staring inside her kitchen. I believe it was around 1 in the morning, so it was very dark out. Nobody could have seen us standing inside her house in the dark. So that too was very weird that that version of me kept looking over at the window. Almost as if she, or I, knew we were there. This has baffled my mom and I for a very long time. I've never been able to find anything on Google that is remotely close to what I'm talking about. The only thing that I've seen through research is information about doppelgangers. I know the difference. I'm aware of what a doppelganger is, and this was something entirely different from that. Can somebody else who is spiritual and enlightened please tell me what the hell that was? And thank you in advance. Okay, so this one's been on my mind for a while. I've been wanting to get your opinion since I joined Reddit, but I never really dared to, so here I go. In 2018, a group of friends from college and I decided to go and spend a month in Berlin over the summer. We spent our time between part-time jobs, partying, and just simply enjoying the city and its cultural activities. Everyone in the group was cycling places, but not me. We had a bit of a bike situation with mine, and so I decided to spend the rest of our time there on foot or using the U-Bahn, the metro. It wasn't much of a bother until we decided to go and party near the River Spree. This place has bars and clubs, and it's overall a great place to party, but from what I recall, public transportation didn't go that far in the middle of the night. They had all cycled there, so I was the only one without means to go back to our apartment. It was a 20-minute cycle from the bar, but it was at least a 30-minute walk. A friend of mine, I'll call her Eva for the sake of the story, decided to walk back with me, and just take her bike next to her so as to not leave me alone wandering the city in the middle of the night. It was about 4am. Now arrives the glitch. As we were walking down this rather big street and chatting, I remember smelling food and seeing this restaurant past the pedestrian crossing to which we were headed. I'm a foodie, and I was rather hungry, so it was pretty appealing. A woman was sitting there having food. She had black hair. I could see her profile through the large windows, which took almost the entire wall up to the ceiling. I specifically remember thinking, Damn, that's weird that they're still open at this time of night. I gotta tell Eva when the flow of the conversation allows. As I was walking and starting to cross the road to the crossing in front of the restaurant, things got blank and it's like I was on autopilot. I was hearing her voice, but it was kind of muffled. Once we were past the restaurant, Eva stopped and turned to me and said, Wait, wasn't there a restaurant just there with a woman eating? I'd completely forgotten to tell her, it's like my memory had been wiped and restored within seconds. And there it was. A hotel. The large windows were the same, and inside was the hotel's restaurant with the layout and tables that looked nothing like what we saw. 
and no woman was eating there either. We were both very shocked, and we saw that the receptionist, male, short hair, was in there. And I knew we just had to ask him if somebody was eating there just now. It was just too freaking weird. He kind of freaked out about us coming in like that, and said that he'd been alone for hours. After discussing with Eva, we found out that she saw the woman eating, but only saw her back. She was seated with her back to the window, when I could tell that this woman was Asian because she was seated showing her profile to me. After that, Eva never wanted to talk about it again, and even got pissed when I tried to bring it up. Also, people seemed to have changed around me after this event. Even my mom didn't remember something that she should have, and a lot of people seemed different overall. I must also note that I was not drunk at all, and staying up this late was really common for me at that stage. Oh, and fun fact, the name of the hotel is the Grimm Hotel, in reference to the author of many fairy tales. This story is true, though. It's on the Alt Jakobstrasse in Berlin Mitt, if you want to look it up. Any thoughts? So, I have always heard of Glitch in the Matrix stories, and I can't say I believed them to be true until my experience last night. I work in an office building, and the best way I could describe it is that it looks just like you would see in the movies. Once you walk in the front door, directly to the left is a row of cubicles where customer service takes calls, which is where I work. In the center of the floor, after walking in the front doors, there is a small showroom, and to the right there are more rows of cubicles for the technicians, and against the right side wall are the restrooms. So, here we go. I work evenings, as we provide 24-hour service, and this happened late last night. At this time, there were only two, sometimes three, other people working on my side, and on the technician's side, there was one person. Around 11 p.m., I had to go to the restroom, but I couldn't go until the other person on my side got back from break, or there would be no one to answer calls. On one of my monitors, I'm able to see who's clocked in, available, and on break. I was unavailable. The technician was also unavailable, and my coworker was on break. Now, before this gets crazy, keep in mind it's nighttime, and there is very minimal movement throughout the office, and after two minutes of no movement, the lights turn off. Finally, she got back and sat down, and right when I saw available next to her name, I put myself on break at 11.15 on the dot and tried standing up really slowly as my chair happens to be ridiculously squeaky. Standing up slow didn't help. It was the loudest chair squeak I have ever heard, as a matter of fact. But I put myself on break and the timer automatically started so my boss can see exactly how long I'm gone for. But right when I clicked it, and the timer started, I felt weird. Not sick, not lightheaded, just weird. I got up to head to the restroom, and as I was walking, I began to feel light. And with each step, I felt more and more light. Like, if I were to jump, I would just float. As I passed the showroom, the center floor lights didn't turn on, and I walked the same route that I always do. I thought it was weird, but proceeded. I got to the right side of the building, and again, the lights did not turn on. I asked the tech who was in that night if the lights had been acting up all night, and he didn't answer. I peeped around his cubicle, and he was gone, which made no sense, because when I got up to use the restroom, his status was available. It was very strange, but I proceeded to use the restroom. Once I finished and stepped out, the lights flipped on, 
and on top of that, once they turned on, the tech jumped up and said in a joking way, What are you sneaking up on me for? You almost gave me a heart attack. I asked him where he was at when I walked by the first time, which was about two minutes ago, and he looked at me confused and said, I've been parked in this chair for the last three hours. I was so confused and just said, Oh, I must not have seen you, and proceeded back to my desk. As I passed the showroom, the center lights flipped on, and once I got back to my desk, my coworker said something that really freaked me out. She said, Hey, did you finally get that squeaky chair fixed? I didn't hear you get up this time. I sat down and it squeaked pretty loud and she was like, hmm, well, that's odd. And sadly, this isn't the end of this experience. I went to take myself off a break and the timer had only been going for two seconds. I looked at the clock, 11.15 on the dot. I still can't wrap my brain around what happened or where I went when I got up to use the restroom or why time basically froze for the four minutes I was gone, but I can 100% say with confidence that I experienced a glitch in the Matrix. So, a few years ago I spent a month studying French in Montreal, Canada. I stayed at a student residence. I had my own room, but the rest was shared. And for some reason, the agency that booked my stay forgot to book the last night there. I couldn't pay for one more night, as my room would already be taken by another student, as well as the other rooms. So, I would have to spend my last night in Montreal somewhere. As I didn't want to pay too much... I was 19, was just starting my career, and wanted to keep a bit of money that my father had given me for that French course, and I decided to spend the last night at a hostel in the city center. So, I booked a room in that hostel through the internet, got there, got settled, walked around the city for one last time that night, had dinner, and slept. I paid everything with credit card, and it was in my wallet. I put my wallet away in my backpack and locked it in the locker. The next morning, when I woke up, I noticed that my wallet, which I knew that I had put inside my backpack, was no longer there. I had put it away in that obvious front compartment of any backpack. I took everything out of my backpack. Everything. I turned it over and opened all the compartments. I checked inside a few clothes that were inside it as the wallet could have gotten inside of them, but nothing. Nada. I even shook it. It wasn't anywhere in there. I also searched for it in my suitcase, but I knew that I hadn't put it away in there. I knew it was in the backpack. I hardly thought that someone could have stolen it, as both my backpack and my suitcase were kept inside the locker all the time, locked with a padlock, as I said. Still, I went to reception and they recommended me to go to the police station to file a theft report. That wasn't an option, as my flight would leave in a few hours and it was an international flight. Luckily, my ID, passport, was with me, but I needed money. My credit card and all the cash that I had were in my wallet, to at least go to the airport and eat. I just wanted to go home. I asked a college from the French course for help, and she gave me the money that I needed to go to the airport and eat, and then I'd give it back to her as soon as I got home. I even checked my backpack again, in all of the compartments, and took everything out one more time just in case. My wallet was not in there. Okay, so let's get to the end here. I came back home, I'm from Brazil, and the flight was smooth and uneventful. I arrived in my city the next day after two layovers in the afternoon and went to sleep as soon as I arrived. The flight was overnight and I don't sleep well in economy class. And I didn't touch my suitcase or backpack. I just left them beside my bed in my room. 
at night when I went to unpack my bag and backpack, my wallet was in the most obvious place in my backpack, in that smaller compartment on the front of it, where I always put it, and where I had looked the previous day repeatedly. I froze right there, and I had goosebumps. I knew that I had searched everywhere, and it was in the compartment that I knew it should be. I swear I had taken everything out. I had checked all the compartments and pockets. I remember I spent like 30 minutes just searching for it in my backpack, with all the stuff out. At that time, I thought it was a kind of supernatural for real, but then I ignored it and just forgot about it. It was good that I kept that little money that I wanted, and I even paid my friend with it. But recently I came across this sub on Reddit and thought that it might have been a glitch in the Matrix. I want to stress that I did not and do not use drugs, or any medication, that may alter my state of consciousness, nor do I have any mental health issues. I know I had checked for my wallet in the compartment that it was in. Again, it wasn't a case of inattention. I swear I had looked for my wallet in every single part of my backpack. What do you guys think? So, like the title says, people, mostly people I barely know but have told my name to before, like patients at my job, for example, always call me by the wrong first name. Every single time someone gets my name wrong accidentally, like we've all called someone by the wrong name by accident, but the name they always call me is always Jennifer. Now, I think everyone's first instinct here would be that it's just confirmation bias, and that I just only pay attention to it when the name they call me is Jennifer, and that I disregard the times they've called me by other names that isn't Jennifer, but I took this into account about 8 to 10 years ago, and started paying strict attention. I have never been called a wrong name that is not Jennifer in this time frame. To get some logical reasoning out of the way, my real name does not sound like Jennifer. Nor does it start with a J or any other letter that could make the J sound in English, or any other language that I'm aware of. And this has happened in multiple different states, so that rules out that maybe there's just a girl who lives locally to me that's named Jennifer, and we just happen to look really alike. Strangers that I don't know at all don't come up to me on the street mistaking me for a different person. It's always people who I've told my real name to at some point. Hell, even people who have known me for a short while but long enough to know better, I'm talking over the course of several months, have called me Jennifer. The freaking priest that married my ex and I, who we had known for a year and a half at that point, called me Jennifer when we got up to rehearsing the vow portion of the wedding ceremony on our rehearsal night. Even though our names were written down in front of him, I freaked that he might do the same thing during the actual ceremony the next day, but he didn't. Yet, he called my ex by his correct name. I do not believe that I look like any celebrity I know of named Jennifer. I've been told that I look like other celebrities, but never a Jennifer. I don't hang out with or work with anyone named Jennifer. Nobody I'm related to is named Jennifer. I've been called Jennifer by different people of different genders, races, different nationalities, different first languages spoken, and from different countries. My real name is a common one, so it's not hard to remember. The only thing that I'm left to deduce is that it's just a huge coincidence that's spanned at least a decade. So, Reddit, what do you make of this? So, a few weeks ago I was at work. I work as a videographer for a local TV station. 
I was at the back side of my work building and loading gear into my car. For context, the station sits right next to a very busy highway. The only other building next to it is a large office building that's been sitting empty for a while, presumably because of COVID. Otherwise, it's just highways and trees. It was pouring rain, and I was standing there at the trunk of my car, quickly getting my gear in before it got too wet. As I was doing this, I heard what sounded like a woman talking over a loudspeaker behind me. I turned around in confusion because I was the only one out there. At first, I thought it was a loud radio coming from someone on the highway, but the voice never faded away. It stayed at the same volume, which was quite loud. I couldn't understand what the woman was saying. The voice was clear, but the words were garbled, like I couldn't make sense of them. After about a minute, I noticed another coworker drive into the lot and waited for them to get out of their car and start walking towards the door, and I'm hoping to see if they noticed the voice. But they didn't react to it. They walked into the building as if nothing was going on, and even waved hello to me. There was no way that they couldn't have heard it. That's how loud this voice was. My final theory was that maybe the office building next door finally had people in it again, and the voice was coming from there. I closed the trunk, hopped in my car, and rolled down the window just a bit so I could continue to listen to the voice. I drove over to the border between our parking lot and theirs, but when I looked over, there wasn't anyone there. The building was still empty. At this point, I was spooked. I also had a story to get to, so I ended up just closing the window and leaving. But in hindsight, I haven't been able to figure out where this disembodied voice had come from. It wasn't from the station because we don't have a loudspeaker on the outside of the building, and it wasn't coming from somewhere nearby, at least that I could find. The part that confuses me the most is my coworker. Why didn't they hear it? Or if they did, why didn't they react? I've been working at the station for over four years, and I've never experienced anything like this, so I'm sure it's not a normal occurrence. Has anyone else ever experienced something like this? I'm an avid listener to your YouTube channel. I really enjoy your Glitch in the Matrix readings. Actually, that's the first thing of yours I ever listened to. It especially piqued my interest because I had a Glitch in the Matrix moment many years ago. I don't know what these glitches are, or even if they exist, or if it's our minds playing an elaborate hoax on us. I feel like maybe they are more of a slip into a different dimension, whether temporary or not. Of course, the most likely answer is that our brains are playing some sort of trick on us. However, if it is a trick, it is certainly a convincing one. I guess I've waxed philosophically long enough, so here's my glitch in the Matrix moment. I'm a woman. My ex fiance and I owned a business together at that time. We lived in a house on a hill in California, and my ex Rod always left for work before I did. He would be there to open the business, I would go in a few hours later and be there to lock up. I usually worked until about 7 p.m. or later. My mornings typically consisted of me waking up and then taking a shower before getting dressed and taking our beautiful Rottweiler, Misty, for a walk. After our short walk, I would put my makeup on, get in the car, and then drive to work. I'd been doing the same routine for about four years when my glitch occurred. One day, I'm not sure of the date, but I know it was shortly before September 11th, 2001, I left for work as usual. When I got to the bottom of the hill, I turned right as always, in the direction of work. I went one block before needing to turn left. At the light where I turned left, 
there was a newish apartment building. Except on this day and all the days following. This day, I get to the light where the apartment building had been for years, and it was an old strip mall. The strip mall looked like any depressing strip mall in a city. It looked dirty and old, and consisted of the usual stuff that makes up most city strip malls. There was a cleaners, a liquor store, and other miscellaneous businesses. There was no apartment building. I looked at the street signs, thinking I must have somehow taken a different turn, but no. It was the same cross street that I had always used. I looked at the strip mall again. Was it new? No, it was obviously old, worn, and even dirty. I felt like a hand was gripping my heart. Surely everyone should be freaking out. How could a huge apartment building suddenly be gone and be replaced by something else entirely? So, I looked at the people around me, expecting everyone to be looking as confused and confounded as I was, but no. Everyone seemed to think this was the normal state of things. I spent the rest of the day in a state of confused fogginess. I walked around like a zombie without understanding what happened. How could it have happened? Why was no one else freaking out? Every day from there forward, I stared at the strip mall, and it stayed a strip mall. I kept expecting it to go back to normal. The entire time until I moved away, it stayed that strip mall. I never talked about it to anyone for years, but it never left my head, nor have I ever been able to explain it. And no, I have never been mentally ill, nor ever taken hallucinogenic drugs. One day, one small part of my universe changed, and I have no idea of how or why. I know it doesn't seem like a huge deal, but after that, the entire world changed. Of course, 9-11 happened shortly afterwards, and after that, everything has felt upside down. Most people my age will agree that nothing since then has felt... right. Perhaps that's because a whole bunch of us suddenly were in the wrong dimension, with no idea of how we got into this strange, divergent world. So, I'm a college student who lives on campus and goes home on the weekends. I have an Xbox Series S, and I take it with me to college and back. Upon getting to two weeks ago, I realized I had unplugged my Xbox at home, but I had forgotten to pack the power cord. I was bummed, but I figured final week was coming up, so I should be studying anyways. When I got home that weekend, I looked in my room, but I couldn't find it. My sister told me before that I left it on the floor after unplugging it, but it wasn't there. I kept looking and found another power cord that I knew wasn't mine, because it had a slightly different head. Same type of power cord, but slightly different design. I had never seen it before, but I plugged it into my Xbox, and the Xbox turned on. I got the feeling I shouldn't use it though in case the voltage or something was different, and it could cause my Xbox to blow out or something. The following day, I was in my room and saw what looked like the power cord to my Xbox, same head this time, but was completely wrapped up, as if it had just come out of the box, with the little twist ties and all. It seemed like it could be a little shorter, but it was definitely to my Xbox. When my mom got home, I asked her if she knew where my sister had put the cord when she found it, and she said that she saw it on the chair in my room, same place that I found it wrapped up. Everything checked out. When my sister got home from work, I asked her. She told me she had put it on the couch downstairs in the living room. I was confused, but figured maybe my mom moved it and didn't mention it, so I asked her a follow-up question. Did you wrap it up and tie the cord? She seemed very confused. She said she placed it on the couch just as she found it, which was unwrapped. 
I never tie my Xbox cord with anything as it's a smaller cord and I can just kind of wind it up like the cord to the vacuum. I asked everyone in my household if they had touched my Xbox cord, and no one but my mom and sister had known it was missing to begin with. My mom didn't touch it, as she had saw it on the chair just as I did. The cord doesn't belong to anyone else, as my dad and I are the only ones with the next-gen Xboxes, and the cords that go to them are identical. But his was plugged into his Xbox. Matter of fact, when I decided not to use the first cord that I found, I took his and used it until I found the other one the following day. I still have no idea how the cord appeared, or where my original cord is, but I'm convinced it was a glitch. This happened to me today, and after a couple of hours of trying to find a logical explanation for this, I've come to the conclusion that I can't. Later, I remembered reading these glitch stories from Reddit some time ago, so I thought I could make my first Reddit post to share this event. Here's some background information to make this a bit more clear. I'm a 20-year-old guy, still living with my family, my mom, dad, little sister, and our dog, which I'll call Molly. Molly is a Newfoundland dog that loves winter and spends most of the days, and sometimes even nights, in our backyard, sleeping and chilling in the thick snow. Today, this afternoon, I was home alone and Molly was sleeping in the snowy backyard like always. Suddenly, I remembered that in the morning, I promised my dad that I would pick up groceries before he comes home from work. It was already 4pm, about half an hour before my dad usually comes home. I grabbed my keys and looked outside of our living room window to see Molly still peacefully sleeping on the snow. I thought about letting her sleep since I would be away for only half an hour, but then decided to bring her inside to get some food and water. I opened the door and called her to come in, only to see the most disappointed dog face ever. Newfies really love the freezing cold air. I finally managed to lure her in with some snacks and locked the door. I was about to leave and walked through the hallway to the front door, Molly followed me all the way, looking extremely sad to be left alone. I told her I would be back in a minute, and slowly closed the door, still talking to Molly as the gap fully closed. That last sight of Molly's snowy paw stuck in my mind, and I remembered being irritated, thinking I would have to dry the whole house with a towel after all that snow melted on the floor. I started walking towards the car, and immediately saw my dad driving into our yard. I waited outside my car as he parked and got out of his car. He told me he had a bit of a shorter day at work, and seemed to be frustrated at me for leaving at the last minute. I told him I just took Molly inside and that she'd be waiting for him beside the door. She usually hears the car coming up and goes to wait behind the door. I saw my dad opening the door as I was slowly driving away from our yard, expecting to see a happy Molly welcoming him. Molly wasn't there, which was a bit weird to see, but I didn't think much of it. Dad stepped in and closed the door after giving me a seemingly surprised look from not meeting Molly right away. I left and thought to myself that Molly probably went to the kitchen to eat or drink, and then ran to my dad right after the door was closed. I was away for about half an hour, and when I got back inside, I saw dad brushing Molly's fur in the living room. As I was putting groceries in the fridge, my dad asked me why I told him that Molly was inside. I quickly answered, saying that I brought her inside right before I left, like I said before. 
I didn't really understand what my dad was trying to ask. He said that when he came in, he saw Molly barking behind the back door waiting to be let in. We argued for a bit of time, me telling him that I clearly remember Molly sitting behind the door with her snow-covered paws and a sad face a minute before he got in, and him telling me that she was barking behind a closed door in our backyard. I then asked about snow or water on the floor, and my dad said there was nothing on the floor at all, not even the smallest puddle. Some of you may know how badly wet snow can stick to long fur of a dog that's been rolling in it. Considering the size of an adult Newfoundland dog, that amount of snow melted into water would look like it's been poured from a bucket. I have no idea what happened. I wasn't intoxicated or significantly tired, and there's no mental illness in our family. Also, my dad never lies, and even if he did, what would have been the point in it? So, was this a glitch in the Matrix? To start, my day and location. I had a ton of trouble falling asleep last night. I tossed and turned all night, and the last thing I saw was 3 hours and 45 minutes until your alarm goes off on my phone. My alarm then went off, and I decided that, in that moment, I was calling off work for the day. I texted in, and my foreman sent me an okay with a thumbs up emoji. It was no issue to either of us, since the union we both work for demands that exact situation. So, I slept until 7.45 a.m., and crawled into bed with my youngest son, who's barely one, to catch another 15 minutes or so of sleep. We both then woke up around 8 a.m. I feed him oatmeal and a bottle of milk, and I had some Vitality Vanilla Almond Cereal. I laid around watching TikTok, while he watched Coco Melon until I decided to head to town to handle a few errands that I wanted to take care of. This is where it gets weird. I needed an oil change, an air filter, and a workout. I decided to run to AutoZone first, the gym second, and after, if I had time, Superlube for an oil change. I walked into AutoZone and told the worker that I needed an air filter for my 2010 Toyota Camry. The employee backed up and started half laughing. He asked, didn't you just leave? I said no, that I was just starting my day. He then told me that I was the third guy that looked like me that came in this morning, owning a 2010 Camry and looking for supplies. The first one wanted windshield wipers. The second wanted an oil filter, and I needed an air filter. He then told me all about the other guys, and they sounded just like me. Here's the very weird part to me. I live in a town of less than 10,000 people. It's a Wednesday morning, and my car is 12 years old. I've grown up here. I live three houses down from where I grew up, and I know at least 80% of the people that live here and I know their family. I don't know of more than two other 2010 Camrys in town. I don't know of one other person that looks like me especially today when I'm wearing an ill-fitting gym outfit. I was wearing shorts that were too short, and a shirt that's dirty and worn out that I've worn for years. And the fact that he was weirded out weirded me out. I joked, saying, see you in an hour, and he didn't laugh or acknowledge my joke at all. I paid and left. Also, I haven't been to AutoZone in over a year and I've never seen this guy in my life. I work the night shift at a hospital. This had already been a strange week, where time just seemed to be... off. I work in a very fast-paced environment, 
so 12-hour shifts go by in a heartbeat. On Tuesday, we had even more chaos than usual, because our phone system was acting up. It worked well enough that people could call, but they could not hear us. So, people would call repeatedly, and scream into our ears that our phones weren't working. And this went on the first three hours of my shift, with me and my coworker taking down numbers off the caller ID and calling people back on cell phones. At the end of that three hours, I really felt like I had been stuck in a time loop for several days. I even mentioned it to my coworker, but they didn't seem terribly concerned. On Thursday of the same week, I came home and went to bed as usual. I took my melatonin and put on a playlist of my favorite creepy stories on YouTube. I usually wake up at 5 p.m., so I have enough time to shower and make my commutes to work. On this particular day, I woke up at 4.18 to use the bathroom. Well, I thought, better 40 more minutes to sleep than to wake up 10 minutes before the alarm. My stories were still playing. I went to the bathroom, and when I realized which story was playing, I thought, oh, this is a good one. I'm going to start it over. I went back to bed and quickly fell back asleep. I woke up again, needing to use the restroom again. I looked at my phone, and it was 418. The story was at the same point that it was in the first time that I woke up. Okay, I must have looked at my clock wrong the last time. Maybe it was 3.18. I look at the timer on this story, and it'll be an hour into it because it's at the same spot. Nope, it was 38 minutes in. There's no way that I could have confused 3.40 with 4.18. Also, my bladder isn't that small. My husband says that I dreamed the first potty break, but that would mean I dreamed something that happened in reality, almost exactly as it happened in my dream. Needless to say, I was not able to go back to sleep the second time, nor did I restart the story for fear of it recurring repeatedly. Furthermore, I would have had to have dreamed word for word a story that I had only heard one other time while a different story was actually playing on my phone. Fortunately, I haven't experienced anything resembling time loops since that week, nor have I had any premonitions of bathroom trips. It's not an experience that I would recommend. This happened over 10 years ago, but the details are very easy to remember. It's something that never made sense to me, but maybe there's an explanation to be found in this sub. I was a freshman in college playing soccer for the school's team. The beginning of the school year is the beginning of the soccer season, so we had morning practices and afternoon practices at this time. We had a fitness practice at 6.30 a.m., on this particular day. I'm one of those people that is never late to things. I'm very careful about alarms. I'm very careful to have good attendance. Missing a practice or being late was not something you wanted to do. The whole team would ridicule you and embarrass you. You would have to run laps or do stairs, and it's certainly not going to help you get playtime. I woke up this morning, close to 8, and slipped all the way through practice and looked at my roommates so as to say, What happened? Did you turn my alarm off? They all three said they don't remember any alarm. I'm practical. I know for a fact that I set my alarm because I simply remember doing it the night before. But I can easily accept the fact that I probably turned my alarm off in a drowsy stupor when it was going off. So... I go about my day and must head to class, dreading a text from a coach or a captain. I go through my first class and haven't heard anything. Heading to my next class, I see one of the captains, a senior on the team. I'm kind of embarrassed to say something. He comes in to dap me up, and I say in my shame, 
So how screwed am I that I missed practice this morning? He looks at me and laughs, and then says, Dude, I missed it too. I slept through my alarm somehow. Apparently like six people didn't show up, which is kind of crazy, right? And they have another practice for us tomorrow morning. It's gonna suck. I left for class somewhat in shock. For me to miss a practice for sleeping in was basically something that never happens. But for five other people to miss the same practice is just so statistically and incredibly unlikely. The next day, I asked everyone why they missed. And they all had the same answer. They missed their alarm somehow. And not one person said their alarm was reset, like the power went out. People were still using physical alarm clocks at this time. The power going out could not have been the answer. We were all aware of how strange it was, but everyone just kind of laughed about it and moved on. The likeliest answer is an extreme coincidence, but maybe there's a different explanation. Who knows? Edit for reference. Sometimes someone would miss a practice, and in an extremely rare event, you might have seen two people miss a practice because they went out together drinking, or something the night before. So, about two years ago, I would walk to and from high school. I only lived around four blocks away, so it was a brisk walk to and from. I live in a safe neighborhood in the middle of a desirable school district. I know all of my neighbors, even the ones down the block, and I recognize everyone on my walk to and from. That's why this shook me up so much. I was walking back home from school one afternoon when a yellow car pulled up just a few feet from behind me. I didn't think anything of it and kept walking, yet they honked at me. I turn around and look at the car, and I vaguely recognize the people inside. There was a driver and two kids my age in the back. The driver looked similar to my homeroom teacher, and the two kids looked similar to two twins who were in my grade. I felt as if something was telling me to keep walking and ignore them, but like a horror movie protagonist, curiosity got the best of me, and I walked over to the car. When I got closer, I noticed details about the people in the car that seemed... off. For one, they looked eerily similar to the people I knew from school, yet... Each one had just a few details that made them unrecognizable. It felt like the uncanny valley effect. I can't really explain it well unless you know the people in person, but it was like someone had a police sketch of them made ultra-realistic, if that makes sense. When I got to the passenger window, the woman said, Do you know these two from school? And... I just said, um, yeah, I think so. And she nodded and asked if I needed a ride home. I told her my dad would pick me up a block down from here, and she asked if I needed a ride down the block. I told her I would be fine. I felt the worst kind of vomit-inducing dread when the woman talked to me, and it didn't help that the two girls were dead silent in the back the entire conversation. She told me to have a good day, and as I walked away, she honked at me again. I whipped my head around, completely freaked out, and she just smiled and waved at me. I booked it home after that. I locked my doors, and I waited for my dad and sister to get home, and when they did, I told them what had happened. My dad was nonchalant about it. He told me not to walk up to cars next time. My sister, on the other hand was super freaked out and even now doesn't want me to bring it up. My friends think that I met some kind of weird doppelgangers, and I kind of agree. Two years later, and I can still remember it, it just weirds me out. I 
I don't know exactly how to tell this experience, since English isn't my first language, and it's about a pretty odd thing that happened to me once. I don't know if this can be considered a glitch in the Matrix, but it's either that or something I cannot for the life of me explain. It's silly, really, but I can't find an explanation to this day. It was a Saturday afternoon, and I was watching a suspense movie with my mom. I remember it had Julian Moore in it, and it had something to do with a guy with multiple personalities. It was a cold and foggy winter day outside, so there wasn't anybody outside in the streets or anything like that, and it was a very quiet day in general. And there was a window by the side of the sofa that my mom was laying on. I was on another sofa paralleled to the one that she was on. It was a pretty small living room. And since I was also laying down, we were both facing the TV. But I was pretty much facing the window too. I only had to slightly turn my head to look outside. We had the neighbor's house on the other side of that window, but it was too far away for anyone from their side of the fence to reach our house. And besides... There was nobody home in their house that weekend. They had a dog, and they even took the dog with them to wherever they traveled to. So, the movie ended, and as the credits were rolling, we suddenly heard the window glass tremble a little, and then a liquidy squirt sound. And when we looked at the window, there was a very large spot of water running through the glass, it was exactly like if someone had hit the window with a water gun, but immediately my mom and I ran to the window, and there wasn't anybody there. Also, from where I was sitting, I could see if there was someone outside the window without getting up, and there wasn't. The only place where it could have come from was my neighbor's patio, but there wasn't anybody there. Our window was pretty high from the ground, and it was clear from the mark that the water made on the glass that it came from a straight angle, not from above, not from below. It wasn't raining, and there wasn't anyone in sight. It just came out of nowhere, and there wasn't even a sound of movement outside because it was cold and there was nobody out in the streets. And that's pretty much it, really. It happened fast, and it isn't anything too exciting, but... From that day, my mom and I could not find a reasonable explanation to that happening. I mean, could it have been a bird or something that flew by and maybe somehow peed on the window, but managed not to collide against it? It seems highly unlikely. I would have at least seen a shadow of something moving outside, since I immediately looked in its direction, and I honestly just don't know. I've been dying to post this story since it happened, but I had to wait to hit the karma requirement. I'm super excited to hear people's opinions on this. So, for context, at the time that the story occurred, I lived in a dorm at my college. I had one roommate and our door was always kept locked. On my desk, I had a jewelry holder that was a tray separated into six or so compartments, I kept a bunch of random stuff in it, but the object in question is a miniature screwdriver meant to tighten or loosen the screws that secure a bracelet that I wear. I rarely used this screwdriver, the bracelet is a pain in the ass to take off, but the tray was positioned by my bed in a way that the screwdriver was in my direct line of vision when I laid on my bed on my side. I made direct eye contact with it every night. I looked through the tray and it was nowhere to be found. I started getting kind of freaked out because I hate losing things, and there's no way that I had moved it since I last saw it. At this point, I asked my roommate to help me look because I figured I was just blind or something. She couldn't find it either. 
We then dumped the tray onto the floor and shuffled through everything just in case both of us had somehow missed it. After looking three, four times through the pile, I felt defeated, and I put the stuff back into the tray. I was standing by the tray and took one last look and did not see it, and my roommate walked out of the room first. I followed behind her, and she locked the door. In other words, she had the only other copy of our room key in her possession. I wore my key on a different bracelet, so I know I had mine on me too. A couple of hours later, we return to the room. She unlocks the door and I walk over to my jewelry tray again, and lo and behold, the screwdriver is sitting in the exact spot it had always been, tucked in its little corner like I hadn't dumped the tray on the ground a few hours earlier. I picked it up, and my roommate and I both started freaking out. We had both checked multiple times, and there was absolutely zero chance that we had just missed it. It's been a few years since this happened, and I still think about it. When I see my old roommate, we still talk about it. I just don't understand how it disappeared and reappeared in the same spot that it had been in. Further, no one, including my roommate, even knew about this screwdriver because it had no purpose except for tightening the screws on the specific bracelet that I would wear. Sorry this post is so long, but I wanted to be as detailed as possible. <laughs> 